Franklin County Board of County Commissioners, nine session. Commissioner Jones, would you lead us in the prayer and pledge, please, sir? Yes, sir. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time you've given us together here this morning. We ask that you would be with us, not only in knowledge and understanding, but in discretion and wisdom. Thank you for every day you give us here in this beautiful place we call home. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Liberty and justice for all. Come on. Come on, Warren. Next on the agenda will be approval of the minutes. So moved. Got a motion on approval by Commissioner Massey. Second. Second by Commissioner Jones. That'll be the minute for the July 7th agenda meeting minute and the July 7 workshop minutes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? That pass unanimous. Next on the agenda be payment of the county bills. So moved. Second. Got a motion on the floor by Commissioner Masters, second by Commissioner Parrish. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? That pass unanimous. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I, I'm sorry, sir. If I may, before we go to public comments, on the line, I have Sarah Hines. Uh, I know she's scheduled for later in the, in the meeting, but I kind of wanted to get her on early because, you know, our numbers are taking a drastic uptick okay. here. So I'd like her to address the board before we get to, uh, to public comments. And Sarah, are you there? Go ahead. Uh, Sarah? I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Go ahead, ma'am. Okay, you want me to go ahead with my update now? Yes, ma'am, please. Would you go ahead with your update? And then um, from there, the, the commissioners might ask you some questions. That'll give me a okay. name for that, the record. That sounds great. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, this is Sarah Hines, the administrator for the Florida Department of Health in Franklin and Gulf. And um, just doing a sound check, can you hear me all right? Yes, we sure can. Perfect. So I just wanted to give you a brief update about COVID-19. You know, for the past 11 days now in the state, the positivity percentage has been around the 11% mark. So we're hopeful that this means we are seeing some stabilization in Florida. As of yesterday, Franklin had around 158 cases with 23 of those being inmates. And we will have more inmate counts um, to add to the overall total. So expect to see a larger jump in this week's overall total case numbers. We are also continuing to see cases in household, household settings, you know, where one person was positive and later on the family unit all become positive. We've had some exposures in workplace settings uh, with businesses. There have been uh, some funeral gathering exposures, some other types of gatherings of groups of, you know, families and friends, and then we have had some healthcare workers. So we're, we are seeing um, community spread in, in Franklin County. Um, we're trying really hard to explain the data in our daily briefing so that the community can really get a sense of what's happening. You know, the FloridaHealth.gov page, it has a lot of rich information to look at, and we're trying to provide the community with the best behind-the-scenes look um, regarding those numbers. So, for example, you know, we're, we are trying to let you know about the inmate count, the inmate counts, and we want to keep the community aware when they look at the total how many inmates are, are part of that total. So on a local level, you know, we use our briefings that we issue out every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and we're trying to pull information that we believe is the most helpful in understanding all of this and to provide the background information about that data. So if you haven't been receiving this information, all you need to do is text Franklin C V for COVID. 19, so Franklin CV19 to 888-777, and the briefing actually goes straight to your cell phone in the form of a text message. So we've had that capability uh, for many months now, and just if you haven't been on that text, you, you still have that opportunity. So overall, the positivity in Franklin is at 5%. So if you really want to pay attention to, you know, one briefing more than the other is always follow that Friday briefing. 
And with positivity, you know, we don't want it to go any higher than this. The positivity benchmark is something that we've started sharing to help understand the trends, um, something that the state closely monitors to help determine if we are at a healthy enough benchmark to move forward with the reopening phases. And in addition to medical capacity, of course, hospital capacity and the downward trends, you know, we do look at positivity and how many are positive each week in the community. So each Friday you'll see us share two weeks worth of positivity data available in Franklin as well as Gulf because, you know, we cover both counties. And the data takes all of the positive cases by the week and it compares it to the t total number of tests that week. So it excludes any previous positive folks um, so that the number isn't skewed. And the governor monitors this daily. If you ever watch his briefings, he talks about the positivity trends. Um, but from a local standpoint, we like to look at it on a, on a weekly level just to paint a better picture of what's happening in Franklin. So we went from 6% to 5%. Um, we have had some de decreased testing occur statewide from some state coordinated closures that were due to the storm last week. But we didn't stop any of our testing locations at our facilities. So PanCare is planning, if not already, to stop their rapid testing operations in the community. It sounds like this effort was made to prepare for rapid testing on school grounds. So uh, we will be working with them on this effort. Having said this, you know, we continue to test for COVID-19 at the health department. And we know Weems is providing um, COVID-19 testing as well. So we have great partnerships in place. Um, but just a few things on that, you know, please, please do not come here um, from another county just for the purposes of getting tested. We're really trying to test our residents and to fill up the appointment slots for Franklin County residents. And, and so the same goes for visitors. You know, get tested before you arrive and wait for those results. And if you're a close contact to someone who was waiting on the results um, and you're a visitor, stay put until you know that they were negative before you visit here. We have had some situations occur um, just like that. So. If you're, now, if you're worried about an exposure that occurred during your long stay here, sure, that's a completely different story. But overall, please get tested in your county, in your community. And also, you know, we do try to prioritize testing for people who have symptoms, you know, to the extent that we can. So, um, but we do want to also talk about exposure to the positive context. So if you were around someone yesterday, for example, who found out they got a call from the health department that said they were positive, please don't jump in your vehicle, drive down to the health department to get a COVID-19 test. You know, the infection can take anywhere from two to 14 days. And we've seen a lot of people become infected around that seven to 12 day mark, right, Emerald? I've got Emerald Larkin in here uh, with me. She's our nurse, our epi lead, and she's nodding her head. So it's better to wait. Um, if you don't have symptoms and continue to follow your quarantine orders, uh, which would say to quarantine for 14 days from the date of your exposure to that positive case, and actually, if you don't have symptoms, you can just quarantine for 14 days. The goal behind, you know, sitting on the couch at home and not being around other people is to simply interrupt the disease from spreading to others. So by being in quarantine, following those quarantine orders, you are actually helping to stop the spread. So that's really my overall update for today. Just some highlights, some messages we've been sharing for some time. Um, you know, we are. Um, working closely with the TDC and Chamber on a business campaign to promote businesses who are really uh, stepping up to promote and protect um, the, their employees as well as their customers during the pandemic. And we found a nice pledge campaign and as soon as we have that finalized we'll be able to launch and make sure that um, we can um, provide that information in the next board meeting. So um, that's about all that I have. If you have any questions, I'm here. Anybody got anything from the time? I just want to say, uh, Sarah, I appreciate these very best health practices. I think that this provides just a just an overview of how we care here in Franklin County, and specifically, uh, our marching orders here at the County Commission is exactly paralleling what you're saying here, and how we're protecting the public. And I, I'm really pleased to see the continuity of care that we're doing throughout the, co the county here and honoring federal and state guidelines. Very important. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. And I appreciate your leadership um, to help support and protect the, the health and safety of all residents in Franklin. So thank you.
Anybody else got anything for Ms. Hine? Keep okay. up the good work, Ms. Hine. Thank you so much. We will try. All right, sir. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Okay. Next on the agenda, we got anything else before we do the public No, comments? now we can go to public comments. We have three callers at the moment for public comments, Commissioner. Next on the agenda, we got public comments. Okay, so the first number I'm going to unmute is uh, A50 area code 4081773. Three 1773. Uh, please state your name for the record, and you have three minutes uh, to address the Board of County Commissioners. Good morning. Okay. Yes, this is Mike O'Connell. Yes, sir. Yes, are you ready? Can you hear me all right? Yes, sir, yeah. we can hear you. Go ahead. You have three minutes to address the board. Good morning. Great. This is Mike O'Connell, past president of the St. George Island Civic Club. Our current president is Jim Morris, and he was unavailable, and he asked me to represent the club today. Today is a big day for St. George Island. On your agenda, there are two significant issues that will affect the island in a positive manner. There is a re restore, restore funded project that directs an engineering firm to design a remedy for our storm water problems that have been around for years. Our flooding has become a serious issue for our visitors and businesses. This design will enable us to tackle our paving and parking problems in the upcoming years. The second thing is there is also an opening of the bids for the construction of a new bathroom on the island. We are very excited about this. This structure will be a wonderful addition to Lighthouse Park and the island. These two agenda items represent the next chapter in our 2025 vision for St. George Island, primarily the business district. We stand ready to provide you with any assistance and input you need in the upcoming years. Finally, we would like to thank you for paving Bayshore Drive from Franklin Boulevard to First Street. This, I, we've talked to, I've talked to the business owners there of the Pig and Harry A's, and they're very excited about that, and we thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you for everything you do for us. We wish you well, and be safe. Thank that's you. It. I'm sorry, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Connell. Have a good day, sir. All right, Mike. Bye. Goodbye. Okay, so my next caller is 850 area code 50, oops, 508 5216. I'm going to unmute you now. 5216, you've been unmuted. Good morning. State your name for the record, and you have three minutes to address the board. Hey, my name is Candace Millender, and um, I'm calling today to speak about my road, Buck Road in East Point. Um, I have been before, I would really like the county to take over our road. We have been fighting for this for over 10 years now. I pay my county taxes every single year. I get no services from the county whatsoever. All of the water runoff from Ridge Road washes down our road, washes it out. Um, the water has nowhere to flow past my yard. My, the ditch for our whole road ends at my yard at the end of the road. The, there, there could be a solution to this if the water department, who has the very end acre with their well on it, would just dig a ditch through their property, through their driveway, and let it run out into Bear Creek. All of the water from Ridge Road um, also runs through a trench that was made during the fire and all of the treetops were all trimmed off and left in the ditches. Nothing was ever come back and cleaned up after the fire and the hurricane. Our culvert at the end of the road is completely grown up. That is in the right of way for the county. I've called several times to have that fixed and just the right of way filled in so you're not falling off of a two foot drop onto our road from Ridge Road. That has never been done. Someone came and shoveled a few shovel loads of dirt into a one side of the road and that was it. Um, I've, I've seen three roads in Ricky Jones's district paved within a week. So that tells me that the county has funds to fix roads. 
whether mine is county maintained already, two of those roads that was paved was dirt roads. So now I would like my road to be taken over by the county because it was deeded over to all of the residents from the previous owner. We are not making a homeowner association. That was not what we bought land down there for. The, the county has access to the road. They can come and fix it, dig out our ditches, do whatever needs to be done. The water department can come down there and dig a ditch through their property so the water can flow properly to the to Bear Creek. So I just really would like to have the county take over and do what they can. I've never asked for our road to be paved. I've just asked for it to be drivable. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miller. All right, Commissioner, uh, next call I have is area code 850-567-3320. Uh, caller ID says I'm Mr. Melinda, but let me make sure here. Uh, good morning, sir. Uh, you, uh, state your name for the record, and you have three minutes to address the board. 567-3320. Mr. Melinda, you, you check to make sure your phone is not muted. One more time, 850-567-3320. It's uh, Anthony Millender is a caller ID on the phone. And they're, Commissioner, they're muted, so I guess they don't want to talk. And that's the last person for public comments, sir. Okay, any more public comments? Without no more public, public comment, the answer to that young lady on that's a private road County don't work on private roads and for the water district. She had to check that's separate from the county. She'll have to check with them on that. Next on the agenda. Next on the agenda will be where we at? Department Directors Report. Superintendent of Public Work, Mr. Howard Neighbor. Come on down. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioner. How y'all doing? Good. Good. I got a couple issues, well, a couple uh, things that uh, with the, some of the crew, some of the temps left, which was three. Uh, then I have two employees that's retired, so we down five people and no inmates, too. So. Uh, we're doing the best we could do with the grass cutting and ditch cleaning and road work. So that uh, also, which should be in the bull report, on Bobby Lolly retirement to uh, reappetize for that position mm -hmm. for board's approval. So moved. Second. I got a motion on the floor by Commissioner Paris, second by Commissioner Boat. Discussion on that. Oh, um, you say you two men now? Two, well, I had Ricky Rickers, which we appetized. I hadn't had nobody in that spot yet. I've had one application turned in. So okay. Uh, oh, yeah. So you going appetize for two or one? I want right. just one. We, one. one we don't appetize for, but which I hadn't had nobody in that position yet. So then we're gonna hire for Bobby Lolly's position. Okay. So, any more discussion? I got something for Howard. Howard, won't you uh, check right there at the mouth of Buck Street in that ditch mm -hmm. and see what we can do and fix that drop-off? We've looked at that. I mean, we fixed it in a while back. It may be washed out a little bit now if you get a heavy rain and stuff, stuff, which that water does run down that road a little bit because it goes down. So, But uh, we'll check it. In some way or another, we've got to do something because school's fixing to start. And that bus is not going to be able to go down that road, you know what I'm saying, and turn around. So I know we always give them a temporary fix before, you know, to try to fix that road temporarily to help them. The bus is not going to be able to go down Buck Street and get turned around. It's a mess. I've been over there two or three times this week. I mean, we've got to do them a temporary fix or something. When we get down there, we have in the past done a temporary fix, you know, to do something with it. And on your grass mowers, Buster, 
I know you got a couple grass moors I've looked at out there. It's got several hours on them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if they go down, we're going to be in trouble. Don't we have some I, FEMA money to replace one of them tra uh, tractors for grass? Oh, we do. Um, that's actually in next year's budget. So starting October 1st, we actually have that budgeted in the capital outlay fund. So that, and that was Howard's FEMA money being transferred in. Okay, yeah, I've talked to Aaron about it, so about the grass tractor. We got two. One of them's uh, about 16 years old, and the other one's going on eight years old. But the other one we just pull a drag with, so about one we got goes down. Well, if I think it's 4,000 hours on the MT465B, which the hours, motor runs a long time on them tractors, but you got your PTOs and your house and your bear and stuff like that that goes out in them tractors. That so, one I looked at had a lot of hours. A lot. You had a 7740, it's got about 8,000. Mm, yeah. 8,500 hours. Well, yeah. If it comes to, at the time, we'll be able to get y'all a grass more air out of that money. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or well, the TS 115, let me recreate that old 7740 is junk. So. That's our problem. When that goes down, we have no way to mow the grass. <coughs> and people's calling and complaining and busters <coughs> down without a grass mower. So we definitely need that grass tractor, if, you know, any way possible. Well, and, you've got the money then. Yeah, yes, sir. So we, we got set. it. And then uh, can you make it till October with what you yeah, got? Yeah, we can. Okay. You know, the thing is, if, if something goes down, you can't, with all the stuff going on, it's yeah. hard to get parts. And if it goes down, I will set up two months before yeah. we get parts to get something fixed. So. Okay. Well, you go ahead and get your bid in now so that, say, okay, October we, we, we look around and try to get the cheapest bid on one. Okay. Well, then also, on my low boys, well, I think the grader should be getting pretty close to being paid for, and we're going to have to get a low bore to haul equipment with. Yeah. Uh, that one low bore truck we got has got a million miles on it. Really? Yes. Sir. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. And once the motor grader is paid off, Howard does have the payment funds budgeted. Yeah, so with the motor grader. That would actually be you know, somewhat neutral. Kind of loosen up when we can get him a, uh, a low boy? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, it's in bad shape. Yeah. And we haul landfill equipment, our equipment, we haul everybody's equipment in the county, you know, that, that's county that goes down. So, Y'all looked at road, the low boy the other day, that's not yeah. too good a shape. But the road department's the only one got the trucks to haul equipment with. So. I know we lease dump trucks. Is it appropriate to consider leasing a low boy? I checked on that. You can lease the low boy truck. It's $8,000 a year. Is that a benefit uh, to the county, and would that help your budget if we did that? Uh, I I ain't for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, Not on that but much the, money. It you think it's yeah the price? Down. Yeah, you're looking at uh, one hundred seventy thousand dollars for the for the truck, and uh, well, about forty seven three for the trailer. So you're looking at a uh, probably one hundred seventy thousand probably for the mm -hmm. low boy truck. Uh, and, and, and he's got the money in his budget for that as well. Uh, once the motor grader is paid off. Yeah. Will it be paid off this this coming fiscal year? I believe so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Have funds this, this upcoming year. C commissioners, if if I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, the, the the balance we have to find with with leasing versus purchasing. Yes. There's some things that we purchase that our departments run right down to the last yes. until the wheels run off. Right. And so you have to stand back and look at a piece of equipment and say, well, if we purchase this, we're probably going to get a longer life out of it than if we keep paying this constant lease year after year after year. Yeah, yeah. we do get a new piece of equipment, but at some point, it, you know, that balance yes. of, of maintenance, you know, yeah. like leasing a car and buying a car, you know, it, it's yeah. it, what is the intended use of the piece of equipment is what we really have to sit down sure. and figure out. And how long does it last? And yeah. Aaron's taught me about sometimes leasing will extend our budget and give us more budget flexibility sometimes as well mm -hmm. so but that reoccurring lease cost though then yes. you have to figure that yes. into your budget versus paying for it and using it for five six seven years some okay. ten years in some mm -hmm. instances yeah. i believe what do you Actually, well like the mac the, yeah the mac dump trucks is one hundred fifty thousand, with which we lease them or we drive them back and forth to perry so if you bought that new mac truck within 15 years it's wore out mm -hmm. so Basically, that's what you're looking at. Then this way, you get a truck every year. You're not having to basically change oil, but maybe once. Mm -hmm. No maintenance, mm -hmm. so it saves the county. The it saves the county money. Good. Okay. With, with the mac yeah, dump truck. Oh. What's your matter? Go ahead. Did you say it was 170,000? The low boy truck. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, sir. And is eight thousand dollars a year lease? Eight thousand dollars. Eight eight thousand dollars a year for leasing. Okay, yes, sir. You've owned the truck for over twenty one years to break even. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. So. So you'd have to intend to have it for twenty five years when you're purchasing. Yeah, with capital truck, is that an option on that one, Howard? Yeah, yeah, we talked to him. Okay. Rusty okay. talked to him, and, and he said well, we could see. lease these trucks for about eight thousand a year. Only county and stuff can get this kind of stuff. Nobody else yeah. can. Yeah. County, yeah. state. Yeah. So. Okay. But, however, the low boy trailer we would have to pay. Mm -hmm. no, no, it would come with it. Oh, I think it, I think it's a truck and trailer, if I ain't mistaken, for eight thousand a year, oh, okay. and you would get a new one every year. So. Okay. Okay. Well, that's a that's a great deal. But I can recheck on that to make sure I'm right. Okay. That's what yeah. We might. See, the leasing is a good deal, then we'll yes. evaluate that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Capital truck okay. The same program that we already have mm -hmm. for the dump well, that way you get a new truck every year and yes. it saves a lot of maintenance. And, yes. and it's responsibly spending the public's money that way. And, Commissioner, you could budget that. Yes. If you know you're going to lease it, then you budget yeah. it every right. single exactly. year. Yes. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. And, it's like that. and the payment funds are already in there, so yes. that's not a so it, it's that Good balance deal. that we have to determine yeah. with your department head, you know, is it leasing or, or, or buying? Because how they use the equipment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Chairman, how long you've had that load, boy? About 25 years? 20. <laughs> I want to say 20 years. I'm not exactly yeah. for sure. I think it's 20. It's one that, that was bought about years ago. It was a used truck. It was um, used when we bought it. Yes, sir. It was used when we bought it. But uh, that's just 2000. The one is 2000, the other one got is 2001. In 20 but, years with recurring maintenance, changing of tires, and all the labor that went in to do all that. Yes, that's the balance. That's another factor. Yeah. Oh, but it's something we could check into. And see. Are you saying that uh, government entities like the county sometimes gets favor in leasing rates? We do. Yeah, um, actually, it was the, uh, the break that Capital Truck is able to offer us on the trucks is because the county does not have to pay federal excise taxes. There you go. Um, so that's actually a benefit to us and then also to Capital Truck. Um, and at the current structure, the only, the only loser in the arrangement would actually be uh, the federal government because they're, they're not receiving those taxes. Mm -hmm. But the county would own the trucks um, in the new lease arrangement for 15 months. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been our, our latest agreement with capital truck and then the trucks are turned back in and they're able to then market those trucks to private right. yep. keep it with the same price mm -hmm. with the same price yes yeah um yeah this last year it was um the prior lease agreement was 13 months and then the new lease agreement is 15 months and there was no change in price so that that was a really good deal for us okay yeah so do we need a motion to favor? No, no, we ain't done the other motion yet. Yeah, we okay. still haven't done the other the first. I mean, I got the vote on the other motion. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah. Are y'all through with the discussion? I got one more question on the grass tractor. It can become October the first. We can get it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. It is in capital outlay, so it's okay. going to affect that board proceeds this year. Okay. Okay. Let's vote on the. Uh, Inmate. Remind the supervisor, the board, yes, to, for Mr. Lolly's uh, for Mr. Lott, for him to advertise for that position. Y'all ready to vote? All in favor? Aye. All opposed. That passed unanimously. Now I need a new, I need a motion so he can get his. The little boy. I'm not, making a not, grass tractor. The grass cutter. Grass cutter, okay. and check on the little boy. Okay. Go ahead. We also have to pay off the motor graders. So once all of that materializes, then um, yeah, I think we're, we're head on the, up the game on that one. Okay, so we're good to go. I think we're good, yeah. Okay, well, you're good to go. Then I got one more thing on, on my trucks. Mm -hmm. I know I bought, I think, four trucks, new four trucks since I took over. And if we have any extra money, maybe this year, next year, we'll probably need two more F-150 trucks, which is about $30,000. A lot of that stuff that they driving is old, old. It's, it's drop down stuff that the mosquito controls give us. So, okay. All right. All right. Well, Aaron, check that out too, because he say he gonna need a in the new budget. Come back and let us know what what he can get, what he got okay. in the budget, and okay. how far we can go. Okay. Yep. And we will get the quotes okay. from uh, Capital Truck on the, the lease right. as well. Okay. 
And if we would, next time, Howard, this is something we should have discussed that, that budget. Um, well, I, it would really during the budget thing, we, we was in a hurry. You know, I was thinking, you know, get out of here because you didn't want to crowd <laughs> yeah, in no. here. So <laughs> no. usually we do talk about all yeah. this at budget, correct? Yeah. So, yeah. But my understanding was get in and get out. So. Yeah, well. Well, we, we made a mistake. We, I should have asked you about the equipment. Uh, about the equipment. Yes. <laughs> Well, on that one, he's got FEMA money to take care of that. Yeah. That's yeah. no problem. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, go ahead. Well, if I could, Mr. Chairman, if, you, if the board's through. Buster, have you heard from Deseret Ranches about eight mile and ten mile roads? I, I hadn't heard, but I checked on, on the roads and the signs. has got the post is still there, but the signs is gone, the posted signs. Okay. So. Okay. Well, commissioners, we... Uh, Michael and I met with Deseret Ranch's representatives last week and they told us they were going to remove the no trespassing signs from the road and relocate them to the edge of the forest so that people knew to stay out of the private forest, but they were not being trespassed off of the public roads at 8 mile and 10 mile. Okay. Anyway, thank you for confirming that. Yeah, no, you're welcome. So they did it, I guess. But they're all going to move the poles too. I mean, the as close as the poles is to that road going in, it is a safety issue. If they don't move them, then maybe we can move them because they, they ride on the edge of that road and you turn in. If you ain't careful, you'll hit them. I say so, go ahead and pull them up, set them on the side of the road up okay. in their woods. Okay. We can do that. They'll pick them up. Okay. Okay. What else you got? Got mm -hmm. anything else, Matthias? That's all I got, Commissioner. Okay. Anybody got anything? Go I'll, I'll, I'll yield to you guys, but I have a couple items in my report. Um, that I want to do while Howard is here, so in case you guys have questions about it. Okay, uh, page 12, items uh, 5 and 6. And Howard, I was going to, uh, yesterday I told Virginia I couldn't get the, the bridge uh, thing in, but I got it, but just bear, bear with me for a second. Item 5, the Road Department has received numerous complaints of the lack of visible striping on Highway 67 while driving at night, especially when it's raining. Since Roberts and Roberts are in the county working on the airport road project, and the board waived the county's bid policy to save on mobilization costs, we asked Roberts and Roberts for a proposal to stripe Highway 67. The striping will start at Crooked River Bridge. That's where the FWT paving project will end, that we'll discuss later, and then the striping will end at the county line. Roberts and Roberts provided quotes for the use of striping with paint or thermo thermoplastic. I recommend using the paint as it is less expensive and F FDOT has a future project to pave north of Cricket Crooked River Bridge. And again, like I said, how are them? They got numerous complaints. Virginia we, kept calling me and calling me about this. We've so. been getting called for five or six years on that. But I didn't know in the future maybe they was going to repave that road or something. I went to the end because it's pretty rough. And yeah. you know, it's not real wide, but I mean, there's, there's no striping on it. You can't see nothing, just a yeah. straight road. So, so I, I'm sorry. Sir. Is that a county road? Yes, 67. 67 is yeah, yeah. 67. Yeah, 65 is state, 67 is county. 65 state, yeah, yeah. correct. And you said paint will be the, which one the best? You said that. The well, cheapest. the thermo, and, and Howard's way smarter than me on this. I think the thermoplastic lasts longer, but it's like six, almost $60,000 more to do that. And my, well, what I'm saying, if in a couple of years, uh, uh, DOT has another project in the works to go beyond, they'd be basically paving over what you put now today, Commissioner. So to me, that's just. Oh, they're coming back. Yes, sir. They have a project. Uh, Mark said two, maybe three years, you know. I think the paint will last for that yeah. long, Howard. Yeah, it think? should. And, and what they do, they mill that road, too, when they go in there. So they just mill all of them lining up, you know, yeah. if yeah. you get the expensive stuff. So Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's why I said the paint, Commissioner. Well, that makes sense. I, ain't, I thought they were just going to start from the end and go. Yeah, no, they'll start from Crooked River and, and go. To the Lake Morality, I think, from 98 yeah. to Lake Morality, I think the first round is supposed to pay. Yeah, because the, the oh, FDOT yeah. project starts on 98 and goes up to, oh. to the bridge. So and that that project will be starting soon, uh, but there will be a future project to go beyond that. And isn't there a sidewalk project beginning there? Yes. Uh, okay. That, yeah. Well, that one will not interfere with the other. I no, think. sir. We're okay. full, full of projects. Uh, six, That's seven. good. They're working on sidewalks now. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, ready to boot. so, and I'm sorry, I didn't mention the paint is seventeen thousand. Oh. I should have said that. I put it in my motion: seventeen thousand one hundred eighty-seven dollars to do the the striping that with paint. Labor. 
With pink, yes, that's the total proposal. You need a motion? Yes, so that I need a motion for. Second. I got a motion on approval by Commissioner Masters, second by two, Commissioner Paris and Commissioner Boo. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All approved. That passed unanimously. Another item, if I may, sir. Um, Go ahead. A while back, FDOT did an inspection at the Timber Island Road Bridge and forwarded their findings to the road department. Mr. Neighbors, your superintendent asked the local FDOT co contractor for Rovial, if I pronounce it correctly, for a quote to make the necessary repairs based on the FDOT inspection. Mr. Neighbors received a $5,985 quote from Ferrovial for the repairs and recommends proceeding with this project. This has been a, a long time. Uh, this it, from that old, last year when FDOT did that inspection, correct? It, it, correct, yes. Sir. Okay, so my, my request is for action to authorize Ferrovial to do the maintenance repair work on the Timber Island Road Bridge uh, for $5,985. So moved. Second. I got a motion on the floor by Commissioner Masters. Second by Commissioner Boat. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? That passed unanimously. And to put in the record, I checked with Clay. This is what I was waiting for yesterday, mm -hmm. Howard. I checked mm -hmm. with Clay because, you know, they have another project okay. that's heading that way. Their scope of work does not include any of the work that Faro is proposing to you. Okay. So it's two different things, but work on the same road. And, and they got to do some diving and stuff on that bridge to seal them cracks and them pylons. Yes, sir. So, I mean, that's something we can't do. I mean, <laughs> We ain't, we ain't got no divers out here. Yeah, so. put on that scuba outfit. <laughs> <laughs> but that's my two items for Howard, sir. Okay. Thank you, Howard. So the, you the public going to be safe on 67 when we put the strike down. Yes, sir. Yes. And that's a long way, too, from, from Lake Moratti Road to to the county lines. A pretty good ways to there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. so. That thing goes to, <coughs> it go up to 20, <coughs> That goes a little way before you get to the Lion Rock pit right there. Mm -hmm. It's pretty good way before you get there, so. I'm talking about 67, huh? Yes, or 67. Uh, it's miles from Lake, from the prison, it's, it's miles. I ain't sure how many miles, but it's a long way, mm -hmm. so. Okay, long as we see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and these numbers all yeah. include labor, don't they? When we see them? Yes, sir. They're all to inclusive, okay. Yes, sir. Anybody else got anything for but the neighbor? Keep up the good work, huh? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. thank you. Next on the agenda will be Solid Waste Director, Mr. Fonda Davis. Good morning. Hey, good, good morning. morning. Hey, Fonda. Uh, nothing on my report this morning that required board's action. I just want to update you a little bit on, uh, we're putting out some COVID-19 signs throughout the county, uh, St. George Island and Caribbean Beach, just asking people to social distance and different things about the COVID-19. Uh, the next thing is Alligator Point. They're doing walkovers. We're getting back on them. There was two left that we needed to take up that you, you approved early on. And also, uh, I don't know what uh, for is career source, or we going to find out anything on them? No, but fortunately, Kim is on the agenda for a different item today, so I'm sure she's going to give him an update. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Animal control doing good, and uh, that's about all I have this morning. Okay. Do we want to look at the uh, mobile recycling project again? And I think you were going to get some bids on materials, and just wanted to support yes. you. Well, Commissioner, I can get up with you a little bit later. I did have a, a company that bids or sell stuff like that they they had a mobile unit uh after the board man to show you a picture of it okay and if you still okay. interested in it. i mean the market is still down right now so i really didn't entertain that mm -hmm. conversation with him but okay. well, i can talk to you on it later anybody else got anything for mr deep i do i commission a couple of things as a matter of fact item 16 page 14 on my report uh uh, after some discussion at your July 30th budget workshop, the board directed me to add increasing tipping fees for any out-of-town garbage, debris, trash, or waste that came across the scales of the county's landfill to today's agenda. Staff will need specific direction from the board on how much to increase the tipping fees as Mr. Davis, Tony Shuler, and I attempt to provide some options to the board. So I'm looking for, uh, we're looking for some uh, direction based on your discussion. 
how much do you actually want these tipping fees to be for uh, out of town? Um, we want to at least get what they're getting in their county. We need to let Bond to make that decision. He yeah. knows how much is being dumped and what's happening. Maybe find out from other counties what they're getting when I that think, happens to them. <clears throat> Chairman, I think that's what discussion at the board, the budget meeting was, is to acquire what other surrounding counties are charging. Okay. And if they are charging different for people bringing stuff from out of county, you know, just their tipping fees for county residents, we're discussing what's coming from out of the county. And I was talking to Fonda earlier before the meeting about us buying a new tub grinder and all, which is in this budget, and, and you chip this stuff up, what the grinder does, and then what are we going to do with the chips? Because our landfill and Gulf County's landfill is still burning with chips from chipping this stuff up. I mean, if we buy a new tub grinder for $800,000 and people are bringing us a lot of debris from outside the county, I think they ought to help, help us pay for some of this stuff. That's mm -hmm. right. Uh, just a tub grinder, 800 something thousand dollars, mm -hmm. and then we got to deal with the chip. Right. And the chips sit there and go through a, a process and catch on fire, and then they're sitting there smoldering for years. Gulf County has the same problem right now. Mm -hmm. So how do we address the chips? And then I'm talking to Fonda, he said he's hoping he can find somebody that will purchase the chips or he's just come get them and get them out of our landfill. If you remember back during the, the hurricane, this was a big issue for me. When these contractors come into this, like state yard here in Appalachicola and did all this chipping, I told them I want the chips removed and this is the reason. And they did remove them. They loaded truck after truck after truck with these chips and got them out of their state yard out here off Bluff Road. You know, it, so it ain't just chipping these things up, these big logs, and I was, what do you do with a chip? And Farmer's got some options, you know, about trying to bury some of them and, you know, different things. But this is kind of what I was thinking. It, I mean, it's totally up to the board. If we just want to leave it alone, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But I see it costing the residents as we have to increase this budget to take right. care of some of this stuff. That's right. I think other people ought to help us do it. That's right. Uh, just as tourists pay the health care tax when they come here. They expect services where well, they've had to help us fund it. And that's the way I kind of see it, but you know, it's up to the discretion of the board. We can just leave it alone and deal with it best we can, but it's our residents here in Franklin <coughs> County that's going to ultimately pay the, you know, we're getting more money in the tipping fee, but we're also filling our landfill up. And now we're having to buy an $800,000 tub grinder to chip these big logs up. Somebody has to help us uh, bear the cost for this stuff, in my opinion, right. but it's totally up to the board. I mean, that's, that's just the way I feel about it. I agree with you, sir. It ain't the people in the counties to take care of the county's issues. We need to charge them. We want to help, but I mean, help, but right. got they got to pay for the help. They got to they yeah. contribute. Yeah, and I'll carry it one step further. It's not only the grinder as we see it today, but we're looking at the need for expanding our landfill uh, property going forward and how do we amateurize all of that while we host other counties bringing their material in so that's a, the grinder is a, a short-term focus I see that and the long-term focus is the extra land Donor, Mr. Chair, well, thing, we, we've also had to buy a new excavator to lug the tub grinder oh I forgot about that yeah I mean okay. we, we incur a lot of expense now yep. at this mm -hmm. landfill to try to help people mm -hmm. and you know yep. when you're in a disaster response like we was in Hurricane Michael I understand that yeah sure but we're past that or should be past that but we're still getting all this stuff coming from out of county yeah and, mm -hmm. and we're bringing the citizens of the county and finally in particular is bearing the brunt of that and that's kind of what I was thinking when I talked about this during the budget mm -hmm. but it is up to the board whatever the board decides I'm good with it but I'm just bringing that up to the board sure. Sure. To on not the, as far as he can help them. I mean, I got to start paying something. Let me ask you something. On them tips, do, don't none of them poke me about them tips? No, uh, no, sir. I actually checked with to load your energy. It's mm -hmm. the closest. But they come down and looked at them, but they, they said it is too trashy. But hopefully we can uh, clean it up some. They do make a strainer that you have to purchase. <laughs> that way. So, but uh, hopefully we can uh, pick out with the incinerator going again. We can burn the smaller vegetation, and now with the the new tub grinder, the bigger log, and hopefully that would they would purchase or either let us get give them to them. Uh, 
They'll come get them if we give them to them? Yes. Are, are those chips mulchable for people's gardens, or are they too big? They probably would be, Commissioner, but you have all kind of trees, or different types of trees, and we don't want to I get see. some out of some poison. Okay, I see, a mixture of other things. Right. And how does our chips become trashy? Is there, was there, is there foreign material in there, like metal and stuff like that? that some, really dirt, mostly. Uh, just, and, and the thing about it is the, the chips do smolder or uh, catch uh, compost and catch a fire, but uh, a lot of it is dirt, too, so that's the reason why I would pile when it first ignited, but it slowly burned because a lot of it was dirt in it, too, from the storm. But, uh, and that, that's, that helps because unless we have to use dirt to mix with it to use for cover. <clears throat> As Commissioner stated earlier, I was telling him that we can bury some. We, we have a little land left that we dig a hole and put the chips to help mix to use it for cover where it won't take as much dirt to cover. Yeah. They don't want that sea grass in it, so what they don't, they don't want it. Right. Okay. All, so, all right. So basically, Mr. Chairman, so we're, we're going to check around, uh, compare prices, and see who else has this type of policy. Yes. We're going to try and mimic something like that and bring that back to you guys. Okay, that'd be good. We're good with that? Mm -hmm. that works for me? Yeah. And if they don't want to pay it, we set them up, let them take it to deal. Somewhere else. Yeah. I mean, you know, we help them long enough. But if they want to pay, if it, but make sure it's worth our while. Okay. If it ain't worth our while, just shut them down. I mean, the good old days will be done gone. That's the way I see it. Anything else? One more thing. Um, you hear that before. So at the bottom of page 14, <laughs> starting on um, item 19, as I stated at the July 30th budget workshop with the assistance of Mr. Fonda Davis, I was able to talk to Warden Duval a few weeks ago, and he explained that the prison was at phase two. Correct, Fonda? It was a phase two at the time when we talked. That's right? correct, yes. And which, did not, which did not allow non-DOC personnel to supervise inmates, so that's why we couldn't get any inmates. He also stated that it was his last week and a new warden would be in place within a week or two. It's uh, my intention to reach out to our new warden, Warden Connor. Um, and I understood from Courtney at the budget workshop, his secretary called for the live stream information so he could just watch the meeting and get a sense of the county and how we operate. So he might be watching again today and then at some point I'll reach out to him. But with you hearing from Sarah this morning with the increase in the, in the COVID in the prison uh, population. I doubt very much, Commissioner, I believe they probably are going to go back to phase one, which is even more restrictive, more than likely. That's what other prisons have done, have done in the area when they have, you know, uh, COVID within the prison system. So it'll, all this to tell you guys, it'll probably be a while before we get inmate labor again. Mr. Chair, we'll go ahead. I have a comment on that. Uh, when you're speaking to the, now uh, the, uh, Warden is gone. Uh, one of your thing here says that they're at phase two at the time, which did not allow <coughs> non-DOC personnel to supervise inmate. Mm -hmm. I'll take DOC supervised inmate crews. In other words, you can give us some inmates, but you can send somebody to supervise them too. Yeah. You, you, you understand? I got that. We don't have to have county supervisors just sending some prisoners with a. With the inmate supervisor out of the prison? They, 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 they did, do. Commissioner. Uh, I know for Parks and Rec, uh, they had a D.C. officer out with about 15 inmates. And I think also, I'm not sure, Buster, but uh, I think he had a, one squad out. That was all they were limiting at that time. So now with the rise in the cases, they don't even let them out anymore. I got you. But, I mean, it ain't all about... We have to supervise them for what I'm trying to state. Yeah, that's right. With, right. You can send the inmate because when they send a DOC uh, supervisor, they get more inmates. Mm -hmm. When it's Franklin County supervising, we don't get before. Mm -hmm. They can get eight, which yeah. can weed eat these ditches and other things and be away from everybody. Mm -hmm. And they can send a DOC supervisor to help find over at that landfill, too. Mm -hmm. And we ain't, we ain't got to supervise them if they don't want us to supervise them because they can bring more inmates when you get somebody out of prison to supervise them. So when you're talking with the new warden or maybe he's listening, you know, we need some help here. Mm -hmm. 
And it ain't got to be Franklin County supervisors. We'll take some DOC supervisors to go with them, which will double the number of people that can come out and work they, when we get to that point. Yeah. You know? They was out about two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. They was out in your district because I was going out there to sign a paper for Pam. They were working right there in front of, right down from Mr. Gannon and uh, what his name? Mr. Griner? Mr. Griner. That they were, ditch they right were, there? They were cutting on the on the other side, opposite side. Okay. They were cutting the grasses. When I passed through there, but they had a, it was a, DOC was over. It wasn't none of ours. Yeah, as I said, they were out, Commissioner, under phase two. Yeah. They're, they're, again, they're limited to as to how many they let out, even <coughs> with their own supervisors. Mm -hmm. um, now. We don't know if they went back to phase one, right? We don't, don't We're not sure. I'm going to call it and find, find out. It looked like it was about six or eight of them. Well, that's, they can do that with the, with the yeah. DOC supervisor, but the county can't, supervisors can't get to four, what I understand. And just so have my going out there to sign a paper for the drum Pam had. He wanted to get off. I went out there and I seen him. You know what? A, a DOC supervisor seems to be a better quality control. They're they're trained, and there's a more of a higher level of safety in supervising than other types. I think that's good. I like that, Commissioner. So that's, you're saying high risk. Okay, all right. You're high risk. Yeah. <laughs> watch, <laughs> watch the trail that Fonda is leading you down, Commissioner. That's what I'm going to tell you. Rocky <laughs> Road. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sir. <laughs> It's better for them to work them too, because anybody, if you get in trouble with inmates, you, and, and it's not right for our workers to get in trouble over inmates. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. What else? Anybody else got? We got anything else for Mr. D? No, I don't. I'm sorry, sir. I apologize. No, we. I, I do not. Any other commissioner? I got one comment. Great. I've been thinking about it for a long time, but. Fonda has a lot of stuff under him, from parks and rec to animal control to solid waste. And, and I appreciate the job he does for the Franklin County. <clears throat> Some of this stuff I helped pass to him, such as parks and rec. One time it wasn't under him, and we passed, passed it right back to him because he does such an excellent job. And I just want to thank him publicly for the job he does for Franklin yeah. County. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate, appreciate it. Appreciate you very much. Yes, sir. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you. So do I. If I need help, which I did uh, a couple of weeks ago because of some, uh, uh, let's just say, COVID exposure within our office, you know, um, fond of, um, he, even though he was already stretched thin, he was able to get a couple of employees to assist me in, 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 you know, in dealing with the courthouse matters. I'll just leave it at that. I'm trying to restrict what I say so it doesn't pin to any one person. But yes, I, I thank him too because he really. He'll try his best to see how we can help, you know. Yeah, and Fonda, you've been very responsive in my district, too, and got many things happening just in time. And I appreciate that very Frank, much. He, he yes, does sir. an excellent job juggling mm -hmm. everything he juggles. And most people don't know it, but Fonda worked for me when he was in high school. Wow. Before <laughs> he came to work for Franklin County. So we go way back, but he's yeah. doing an excellent job, and, and I just wanted to thank him publicly for the job he's doing. So that's where Frank, you get your work ethic from, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Let's thank him with a little increase. <laughs> I didn't know Commissioner Parrish was that old. Ooh. You didn't have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I used to call him Mr. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you wanted your check. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I appreciate you all too, Commissioner. It's, it's mm. been work good working with the board here. Uh, I know we don't always just get what we want right there at the beginning, but before it's all over, it, it happens. And I appreciate that. Okay. Keep up the good work, Mr. Davis. Thank you. Thank okay. You. Uh, next on the agenda, we emergency management director. That's, that's all. What, what is it? Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> 
Jan. Hey, um, <laughs> hey Miss Jennifer Daniels. Hey, Miss Jennifer. Sorry. <laughs> um, Pam apologizes. Uh, she can't be here today. She actually had a treatment done yesterday to do with her back, and she's had a weird reaction to the treatment. So um, we only have two action items on our report. Uh, one is we're requesting the board's approval to retroact the non congregate sheltering plan extension letter that was signed on 721 by Chairman Lockley. Yeah, that's what I went out there for. So moved. <laughs> second. I got a move here on the floor by Commissioner Jones, second by Commissioner Parrish. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? That passed unanimous. Yeah, that was when we thought that storm was coming and they were going to have to put the COVID people, have some way for them to go. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Um, our second one is we are requesting the board's approval and signing of the funding agreement with FEMA for PA assistance or public assistance for COVID-19. So moved. Second. Got a motion on approval by Com Commissioner Masters, second by Commissioner Burke. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? That passed unanimous. That's all I have for action items. That's it. Thank you for your work, Jennifer. Yeah. Thank you. That thumb went on up the cool, huh? Yes, sir. Yeah. If you, don't, if you don't mind, Commissioner, a couple of Go things. Ahead. And these are quick. Um, one is, on, on it's page 11, the bottom of page 11, uh, as authorized by the board, Chairman Lockley signed the COVID-19 local state of emergency declarations for the week starting July 13th, 20th, 27th, and August 3rd. I just need board motion to ratify his signature. Like my, sir. Got a motion on floor by Commissioner Massey, second by Commissioner Jones. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? That passed unanimously. And more, more importantly, why I asked, uh, did this while Jennifer was here, item two of my report, top of page 12, uh, Ms. Pam Brunell, your emergency management director, requested the chairman's signature on a local state of emergency proclamation for what was anticipated as becoming Tropical Cyclone 9 and, uh, and then became Isaias, is that how they, they've been saying it? Isaias. Isaias, mm -hmm. um, Isaias, whichever one, Hurricane Isaias. I just need action to ratify that, even though it wasn't necessary. That I need it in the board record because the chairman did sign that. So move. Second. I got a motion on the by Commissioner Burke, <coughs> second by Commissioner Jones. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? The pass unanimous. That's all I had. Thank you, Jim. Mr. Chairman, Michael, why, why she's here? Did we just talk about the CARES Act stuff? Uh, no, because I have Tracy actually calling in herself okay, this afternoon. Work. Yes, sir. All right. Okay. Let's see, we have a long agenda, so we will be here this afternoon. Okay. So. Um, hmm. We got in and it moved on here. There's a few waves we're watching right now, Chairman, but, but so far, Too so far. good. <laughs> yes, good. sir. Well, keep us posted. Yes, sir. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next on the agenda will be the extension officer, Mr. Eric Lowe's thing. Right. Um, Mr. Chairman, mm -hmm. oh, one, one thing on these, Michael, if I can, before we get started on here, as it relates to our EOC, we have to continually sign these uh, declarations for Every seven days. For COVID. Yes, sir. Ain't there a way we can just allow the chairman to, to do this until COVID is done rather than having to come back every two or three meetings well, and he, he, do he, so many weeks at the time? He, he signs them for every Monday morning. The reason I bring that back on my report, I, I just wanted, in the, even though you give him permission to sign them, I just feel more comfortable having where you ratify his signature for every single one. Okay. Just so it's in the board record and we could, because someone made a public records request for them the other day. So because of that, that's why okay. I actually do that. So you just bring them every month and we do four yeah. weeks at a time? Yeah, I can do them every month and we do all four weeks at a time. Yeah, we can do that that way too. Okay. okay Eric. Eric Lovestrain, County Extension Director. I don't have any action items in my report for you this morning, but just one informational item that I wasn't able to get in in time in my report. I just finished doing a um, six month summary of extension program activities and clientele that we've been serving and a good part of that was during COVID so I just wanted you to know we've been very active and I will pass that through so you guys can get one of these. Okay. Thank you. 
Mr. Chairman, I got a question for um, mm -hmm. Mr. Terry. Number one on your informational item says during this period, extension office assisted citizens on topic interpretation, blah, blah, blah. CARES Act funding for fishery related businesses. What does that relate to? Um, yeah, there is um, funding that is coming down the pipeline for, from the CARES Act that's specifically focused on fisheries related businesses. And um, overall, I think they had like a $10 million pot, but then Florida gets a share of that, which was going to be, I think it was, geez, it's, it may be in there. Um, I can't remember the exact amount that Florida gets based on a, uh, a number that the FWC actually came up with for a percentage share of the total. And it's targeted towards um, commercial fisheries related businesses also um, aquaculture related businesses and um, charter fishing businesses any of those that make their living off of the fishing industry and also seafood dealers are in that mix too can um, apply for some of that funding now the funding um, spending plan is actually being put together and has been a draft has been put together by the fish and wildlife conservation commission and is being submitted to NOAA in early August. I'm not sure if it's gone to them yet. And then when NOAA approves that, that funding will actually be distributed through the National Marine Fisheries Commission. So checks would come from National Marine Fisheries to applicants that are successful in applying for the funding. And um, instructions are on FWC's website. They actually have a, a really good layout that shows the draft plan and what people can expect from that. And um, there is an application period. I think that will be about 30 days long in there for people to submit applications for those funds. So it's targeted specifically at um, businesses that have lost revenue as a result of the COVID pandemic. Um, Could you forward that information to the commissioners? On yes, sir. Subject? I'll do that. I actually have an article that will be coming out in um, the Times probably this next week. and. Um, I put it out in a couple of other digital forms. I'll send it directly to each yeah, of the commissioners. Send us a link where we can hit the link and go straight to this website you're yep. talking about. Yes, sir. Um, can do it. We're having trouble in my business of getting people to de-head shrimp. When you mm -hmm. call them, well, I got COVID. Well, you don't want them coming to your business with COVID, so it's turning into yeah. a loss of revenue because you can't get your shrimp de-headed. If you can't de-head them, then you can't process them and sell them. I mean, so... Yeah, that's, there are some restrictions. Question, and I'm sure there are other uh, business, seafood-related businesses that are, have other issues besides what I'm talking about. Oh, there's a lot, yeah. It, it'd be, be good to have that link so we can download it and see exactly yeah. what it pertains to and, and how that can be actually utilized. There's a trigger limit on revenue losses that you need to be able to document. I think you need to be able to document at least 35% revenue loss over this three month period of COVID and that figure is compared to what your average revenue from during that same period would have been over the past five years. Not only my so, business, but a lot of other businesses, as you know, there was a lockdown. Oh yeah. All your restaurants were locked down. They couldn't sell. So it's hard selling seafood because there was nobody to buy it. Yep. People buy from me wouldn't buy it because they in turn distributed it to a restaurant while all the restaurants were closed down. And now they're at 100% capacity as long as you're six feet, tables are six feet apart, which also li limits the capacity that these people can serve seafood. So uh, what it's you're impacted talking about, a lot, especially yes. during that two months, whatever you're talking about, it was, was very harmful to the seafood industry in general. You couldn't sell grouper, you couldn't sell shrimp, you couldn't sell crab or flounder because there was no restaurants open to bring it to the consumer. So People were left with a lot of product that they yes. could not move, yes. That's what happened, and a lot of product was lost. I mean, people saw on the news um, dumping a full tankers of milk that could not be sold in time because the product's perishable. Mm -hmm. It's the same way with seafood. That's right. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. This, um, yes, sir. Well, this, this for um, just so um, this for wild coat too. People who wild coat or. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Is it wild, wild, just, just for, for wild? people who wild coat oysters? Um, yeah, so like it, wild harvesting or aquaculture? Yeah, uh, both. Both, both. They're for both of them, yes, the sir. wild coat and the agriculture. Yes, sir. If they can document a loss of income as a result of COVID-related things, um, yes, sir. 
it, it's a loan or a grant? It's a grant. It's a grant? It's a grant. Okay. Eric, I'm interested also in uh, this comment about new grants participation, about um, partnering with Bay and Gulf counties to clean marine debris, marine debris from coastal habitats. Yes. Do we have any kind of a grant like that in Franklin County? I've participated with the um, application for that funding with the Bay County Extension Director who actually put the proposal together. And um, we were approved for a $3 million package grant funds through the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation that will address all marine debris in all three counties. So I specifically worked with FWC on locating targets in Franklin County that were included in that list for that funding that's coming through that project. So I'll be working with the project director who's um, basically been hired over in the Bay County Extension Office. He'll be working with us over here with FWC to get some of these boats that are up in the head of the bay and on some of these creeks that got pushed up in there. That big sailboat right at the foot of the bridge there. Even put a structure along the highway that has fallen into the water right along the shoreline on that list. So we have good data from FWC on coordinates and locations and whether or not they've taken fuel out of these vessels already. If not, those are all considerations. Um, title has to get turned over basically to um, NOAA. These funds come through NOAA um, or to the, I'm trying to remember the entity, but the title basically has to get surrendered for the property so that then um, this project can go in and clean it up, whatever the debris is. And so there's several large targets. I think I had 15 or 16 on there for Franklin County that got included in that mix. Well, that's good because, you know, we see a lot of private homes that are now completely abandoned and falling into the water. I, I assume those kinds of items are considered marine debris. They can be, and, not always, but, um, yeah. and this did not actually um, include derelict vessels that are like down at docks and things yeah. because the FWC, this project is going through them as well. Um, they were going to look at those under the derelict vessel program that they have a separate pot of funding for. Yeah, so it's a lot of pieces that will be worked on. The bulk, vast majority of it is in Bay County. They were decimated. Their marinas have vessels still on the bottom and just massive amounts of boats that were damaged and sunk and pushed up in people's yards over there. And, Mr. Chairman, if I might. Go ahead. In a lot of what Eric's talking about when he says marine debris, he's talking about boats and, and buildings, and, but uh, there's a fine line of private property issues. You know, Correct. You had a home on private property and it got washed away. You should have had the insurance to help you with all this. So when you're talking about homes along the shoreline, that's not really considered what we call marine debris. I see. You, you, you understand what I'm saying? Yes, you're going to always face that hurdle of private property versus yeah. public property or, or as he said, derelict vessel program for some of these boats. But some of these boats are not derelict. They were just washed up, such as the one you see on the left when you go across the bridge on mm -hmm. Towhead right there. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a barge and everything over there couple months ago but he didn't retrieve the boat so I don't know what was going on there but yeah, anyway not sure. there's some more up in the head of the bays here that you can see when you go across the bridge if you look up in Big Bay specifically you can see massive sailboats that, that washed away from the public marina down here and ended up up the river so, so these yeah. are some of the things that he's talking about when you're saying marine debris okay. and Fish and Wildlife Commission um, does a regular burning program in the marshes up in the head of the bay down sand beach road all that area and they found several pieces of large structure and boats that are up in there that are you know impairing their ability to go Probably burn docks. yep Things big pieces like of docks that that's part of it washed up in yeah. there, that would be considered marine debris but houses is totally yeah and they don't want to set, set some big sailboat on fire up in the marsh you know and burn that up they want to get it out of there before they burn that area right Okay, anybody got anything else for Mr. David? Thank you, Commissioners. Keep up the good work. Thank you. 
<coughs> Next on the agenda be the library. If I may, yes. Um, uh, Ms. Ms. Roundtree is meeting with the Wilderness Coast IT group to working on some stuff at the library. So she has a report. There are no action items. <coughs> And if you have any questions, let me know. I'll have a call you guys to get your questions answered. And commissioners, if, if, if I may, so we're running behind here already, and I have uh, a lot of the P and Z people on the line holding. So I'd ask if we could amend the agenda. And since John is here, uh, he probably he told me he's going to be quick. I'll let John do the TDC report, and then if you want to, we can uh, take a quick break, or we could go straight into P and Z, whichever you want to do. And then we'll do, deal with PNZ, and we'll come back to the bid openings and Ms. Uh, Ms. Boudreaux. We'll probably do Ms. Boudreaux first, and then the bid openings, and then we'll continue with our agenda, if that works for everybody. Okay. On that library, did she fill them this? Well, on her report, she says that she got eight interviews. Actually, I think, Commissioner, she sent an uh, email to me um, yesterday late about what needs to be done after she fills the position. I told her she just needs to inform the board that she's filled her position. So I will, I'll reach out to her and have her call you about her positions, okay? Okay. Uh, she says she's here, uh, item one, she talked about it and she said she got eight applicants uh, that she received. And I'm assuming that she interviewed everybody. All right. But yes, I'll have her call you, sir. Okay. So if we, go to, if we could go to Mr. Solomon next for the TDC report, um, and then we'll break and prepare for PNC. Okay, next on the agenda will be the TDC, John Solomon, Mr. Solomon. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Uh, John Solomon, uh, TDC Director. Um, I just have informational items, but it's, I think it's something that uh, – promised Commissioner Lockley at the budget workshop that I would have a report for him that was pretty decent compared to what we were facing here recently. Um, the collections for the month of May were $123,839.27. It is a 25% decrease from May of 2019, but it is a much higher collection number than originally estimated. Um, being said, we were only open 12 days in May, and we were only down 25%, which is um, big when it comes to the numbers of collections because it reflects on the collections for the county as well. Um, attached is the collections report that we have, but also I brought some information from our software that we use with the TDC, and I the first. One of the times I like to admit when I'm wrong, when I stated a couple of, about a month ago that, look, we're going to have a severe decrease in collections for the year because of COVID-19, which is understandable. But um, with the documents that we got from key data from our software and the collections from May, I can say we're wrong. The, um, the one you have in front of you, the, the one with two lines, the light line is last year's collection numbers. The dark line is this year's collection numbers. Um, as you can see, starting around 520, we shot up really high, um, which is above last year's. And for the rest of the year, we run out above what last year's collections were um, at the same time period and taking effect that time period was a record collection for the TDC last year. So um, at this moment, we're only down $100,000 from last year's collections. And looking at June and July, what the paid occupancy rate was, we should match or surpass that by just a little bit. So um, which reflects our you know, county taxes as well. The next one is something that they sent me that I thought was really exciting to know. Um, you have a chart that shows um, Franklin County versus Northwest Florida versus Florida in general on collections. Um, the blue line, which is the top line, is Franklin County's percentage of occupancy, paid occupancy for the year of 2020. The next line is Northwest Florida, which includes us as well and then Florida as a whole, um, we're 20, over 25% higher in 
percentage of paid occupancy than Northwest Florida and even higher over Florida in general for this year. Um, these are amazing numbers for the county as it comes to collections and taxes. I know that I talked to Miss Aaron about it as well, so. Yeah, and if I may, I would like to add something. Um, in 2017, Visit Florida shared a study called The Contribution of Travel and Tourism to the Florida Economy. And in that publication, Franklin County ranked second in Florida with 62% of private sector employment being supported by tourism. Um, the tourism industry in Franklin County results in property management positions, house cleaning, yard maintenance, construction spending, fishing charters, dining, support services, and spending in local shops and groceries. Um, it does contribute directly to Franklin County's share calculation for state shared sales tax revenues, gas tax proceeds, and health care trust fund tax dollars. Uh, to put the market in perspective, the state estimated Franklin County was going to have over $70 million in taxable transient rentals just this prior state fiscal year, ending on June 30th, 2020. We're the third least populated county in Florida with a population of 11,000 people. Counties with similar taxable sales include much larger counties such as Flagler, Indian River, Marion, Martin, Pasco, and Santa Rosa counties. I just wanted to bring attention to the fact that the tourism industry does have a positive impact on the county budget. Yeah, I appreciate that, Aaron, because that's one of the things that I wanted to share with y'all where we, you know, if we, if the TDC collections show a decrease of 250000 that's quadrupled with the county collections. And with us showing a um, in slight increase or a match, that means the collections for the county will be similar to last year, if not just a little bit more. And um, that very important, you know, the, with the TDC, we have a great team that we have together and they, during this COVID-19, they haven't batted an eyelash, to be honest with you. It's, um, we, we understand the sensitivity of the area and we, you know, not doing heavy marketing in places that, you know, normally we would um, that are COVID hotspots and things like that. So they've been very sensitive and very diligent in what we've been doing over the last um, few months. And just um, be honest with you, knowing that we're leading the way in percentages and we're pretty much tied with what percentage was last year um, for paid occupancy, that's a, a very good news I wanted to report to y'all. That's a plus. Mr. Chairman, can I say something? Go ahead. John, I'm gonna steal some of your thunder, but I'm sorry that's part of sitting in the seat I'm sitting in. <laughs> Thanks to Chairman Lockley. The Flagler Awards are an annual statewide competition recognizing outstanding Florida tourism marketing. The program was created by Visit Florida to honor the countless individuals and organizations that help position Florida as the number one travel destination in the world. Each year, the Flagler Awards pay, pay tribute to the efforts of those who use their skill, resourcefulness, creativity, and innovation to market Florida to the world. This year, the Franklin County TDC was notified that they have won three Flagler Awards this year. Uh, they've, and we don't know what place they're going to be, but we have won them, uh, your TDC. Now, the first one was for television advertising for the 14-minute TV show, Discover the Forgotten Coast. Another one was for resource promotional material category for our Franklin County Visitor Guide and our direct marketing category for the Villages Open for Business and Peace and Quiet Invitation. So uh, they've canceled the actual award ceremony. We'll be receiving notice at some time. Uh, I hope, sorry, that one of these will actually be a Henry, which is the top place in the category. But those are good things that are going on in, in your TDC. Mm -hmm. Commissioner, those are state award, <coughs> statewide awards yes. that we won? Yes. <coughs> yes. Yeah, statewide and, and not easy to win. <laughs> no. That's good. And you know what it shows? It shows the intra-cooperation of so many different departments within the county. To, to, you know, as we look at uh, good health guidelines from federal and state areas, people look at Franklin County as a safe harbor to come and enjoy their tourist opportunities here. Uh, we, we just don't have the problems that they're facing down in South Florida, and I think a lot of it is just by quality management that we've done over the last several months. And thank you very much for doing that, John. Yes, sir. Great. Good man. All right. Done a good job. Thank, thank you, sir. We've got a great team. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Anybody else got anything for Mr. John, Mr. Solomon? 
Keep up the good work. Thank you. Y'all have a wonderful day. Thank you, Jim. Take five. All right. All right. I'm, I'm here speaking.
Franklin County Board of County Commission is now back in session. Next on the agenda will be the final result. And Amy, before you begin, like I said, I'm unmuting all the PNZ people that are holding so they'll be able to speak to you in case you have a question or they have a question or the board has a question. Okay. okay. Sounds so. good. And you can begin when you want, Amy. Okay. Um, this morning we have a critical shoreline application. Let me get we your have name several. For the record, Amy. Oh. Um, I'm Amy Kelly, um, Franklin County Zoning Administrator. Thank you. Um, we have several critical shoreline applications. Um, the first one, um, consideration of a request to construct a single family private dock located at lot three, block H, Magnolia Bluffs, 215 North Bayshore Drive, East Point, Franklin County, Florida. The applicant has all state and federal permits. The dock will be 269 feet by four foot wide with a 26 by six um, terminal platform and a 12 by 20 boat lift. Request submitted by Dan Garlic, Garlic, Asso um, Garlic Environmental Associates, agent for Charles Galloway applicant, and they do have an existing house. Um, staff recommendation is this dock will um, extend in, into East Bay. Staff recommendation is to approve this item. Thank you, the board. So moved. Got a motion on floor by Commissioner Jones. Second. Second by Commissioner Bo. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? That passed unanimous. Uh, the second one is a consideration of a request to construct a single family private dock located at Lot 46, Rivers Edge, 208 Sandbar Road, Apalachicola, Franklin County, Florida. The applicant has all state and federal permits. The dock will have a 23 by six foot, the dock will be 23 by six foot and a 10 by 40 fixed um, boardwalk, a six by 20 walkway and a six by 40 floating hinged dock. Request submitted by Dan Garlic, applicant, and he does have a proposed house. Staff recommendation is this dock will extend in, into the Apalachicola River. Staff recommends approval of this item. Pledge the boat. So moved. Second. Got a motion on floor by Commissioner Paris, second by <coughs> Commissioner Jones. All in favor? Aye. All opposed, that passes unanimous. Okay. The next item is consideration of a request to construct a single family private dock located at Lot 25, Indian Bay Village, 2009 um, Seminole Lane, St. George Island, Franklin County, Florida. The applicant will need um, state and federal permits. The dock will have two 78 foot by four foot boardwalks over wetlands, 130 foot by four foot dock, and a 20 by six terminal platform. Request submitted by Garlic Environmental Associates, agent um, for John Sims applicant, and they have a proposed house. Staff recommendation, this dock will extend into the Apalachicola Bay. The state and federal permits have been um, issued. I got Second. a motion on the floor by Commissioner Jones. In second. Second by Commissioner Burke. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? I pass your number. And I do have maps if you all would like to see them at any time. Okay. Um, the next one is a consideration of a request to construct a single family private dock located at Lot 28, Indian Bay Village, 2023 Seminole Lane, St. George Island, Franklin County, Florida. The applicant has state and um, will need the federal permits. The boardwalk over wetlands will be 199 foot by four foot, and the dock will be 436 foot by four foot with two 10 by 20 boat lifts and a six by 20 <coughs> terminal platform. Request submitted by Garlic Environmental Associates, agent for Timothy Padgett, applicant, and they do have a proposed house. So moved. Second. I got a motion on the floor by Commissioner. <coughs> Master, second by Commissioner Jones. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? I pass unanimous. Okay. Item Q, consideration of a request to construct a single family private dock located at Lot 16, Heron Bay Village, 2215 Seagull Way, St. George Island, Franklin County, Florida. The applicant will need state and federal permits. The boardwalk over wetlands will be 120 foot by four foot. The dock will be 438 foot by four foot with one 30 by 13 boat lift and one 12 by 20 boat lift and a 20 by eight terminal platform. Request submitted by Garlic Environmental Associates, agent for Hugh Whitehead, applicant. Um, he has a proposed house. 
staff recommendation, the stock will extend, extend into the Apalachicola Bay. The state and federal permits have been issued. Staff recommends approving this item. So moved. Second. Got a motion on the floor by Commissioner Jones, second by Commissioner Mass. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? <coughs> that passes unanimous. Okay. The next one is a consideration of a request to construct a single family private dock located at Lot 3, Block R, Peninsular Point, Unit 5, 1545 Alligator Drive, Alligator Point, Franklin County, Florida. The applicant has both state and federal permits. The dock will be 229 feet by 4 foot with a 6 by 20 terminal platform and a 12 by 20 proposed boat lift. Request submitted by Garlic Environmental Associates, agent for Robert Kirby, applicant, house is under construction. The staff recommendation this dock will extend into Alligator Harbor. The state permit for the 40-foot extension has been received. State recommends approval of this item subject to obtaining the federal permit. So move. Second. I got a motion <coughs> on the floor by Commissioner Burke, second by Commissioner Massey. So, oh, discussion, so they discontinue on the, they get the other permit, right? We won't issue the um, the building permit until we have that core permit. Okay. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? That pass it none. Okay. The next one. Consideration of a request to construct a single-family private dock located at lots five and six, Block M, Peninsular Point, Unit Three. Alligator, um, 1529 Alligator Drive. Did I just read that one? No. Alligator Point, Franklin County, Florida. The applicant has both state and federal permits. The dock will have a six by six platform and the dock will be 225 foot by five foot with a 12 by 25 boat slip with a lift, an eight by 20 terminal platform and an eight by five floating jet ski platform with a separate four by 10 stairs. The 8 foot by 22 um, portable building would not be permitted in the VE flood zone nor in the critical habitat zone. Request submitted by Aaron Sarche, Florida Environmental Land Services, agent for Michelle Darple and Lonnie Davis, applicant, and they have an existing house. Staff recommendation, the dock will extend into Alligator Harbor. Staff recommends approving the dock and stairway in this application. So move. Second. Got a motion on floor by Commissioner Burke. Second by Commissioner Massey. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? That pass you none. Okay. Um, the next one, consideration of a request to construct a single family private <coughs> dock located at Lot 5, Block 51, Unit 5, 309 Gander Street, St. George Island, Franklin County, Florida. The applicant has both state and federal permits. The dock will be 5 foot by 28 foot with an 8 by 20 terminal platform and a 10 by 20 boat slip with lift. Request submitted by Aaron Sarche, Florida and, uh, Environmental Land Services, agent for Rudy Rowe, applicant. The proposed house is situated over wetlands. Staff recommendation is the dock will extend into the canal off of Apalachicola Bay. There is an isolated um, Corps of Engineers wetland on the lot that will have um, to be filled to build the house. The applicant has the, US, um, the Army Corps of Engineer permit to fill this wetland for a house pad. Staff recommends approving this item. Pleasure so, to I got a motion on the floor by Commissioner Masses, second by Commissioner Jones. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? That pass unanimous. Uh, Amy, before you move on, Commissioners, if I ever get my act together, when I spoke to you a couple of meetings ago about a consent agenda, basically, how you guys just went through every one, basically, I would just, Amy would just ask for a motion, one motion that would cover all. And if you had questions, we would remove that one from your, your one motion that covers all the others and discuss any particular one you had. But so when I say a consent agenda, that's what I'm talking about. So rather than go through each one, you'd have already done that, talk to Mark, talk to Amy, and so at this point, we'd have been approving all these items as one motion. That's in the future, though. Got a long way before I can get there. <coughs> can I say something? Go ahead. And before we go any further, the only thing I will say about all these dock permits, and I'm fine with that. People have a right to have docks. The extended problem we've had over time is we go through like we do to get everything right and consider repairing right lines. And I've had 
many, many property owners in my district tell me that people go and put their dock where they want to after they get approved for it. So especially all these that are approved today, we really, Michael, we really need to, the building department to make sure they're putting them where, they, where they've been permitted. Okay. And not just wherever they want to put them. That's the whole purpose behind what we're doing here. Uh, Repair and right lines are serious and I just, it's very difficult to deal with something once somebody's put something in place. So that's, I wanted to wait till after, after it was all done to say that, but. Mr. Chairman? Go ahead. And this could be stressed by county staff when you issue the permit. Yes. Letting them know that we're gonna check behind them and if they, you know, this come up three or four meetings ago, uh, I brought up about somebody else, got a permit and then they crossed repairing lot lines and now they're out in front of somebody else's house mm -hmm. and I had county staff go over there and make sure. So, so staff, I'm gonna make a motion that staff warn these people that once they get a permit, that per permit allows them to build where it's actually stated. If you build on somebody else's, build across those repairing lot lines and don't build according to what the permit that's been issued, you are subject to having to pull that dock up and mm -hmm. start all over. Right. Without right. that, they're going to continue doing what they want to do after they get a permit because there's no risk. Right. Well, we already got it built. Are we all right now? Well, they need to build according to what the permit says they're going to do. Uh, and that's the way I feel about it because I've heard from people off the island myself from this same issue of yep. people getting a permit and then they just do what they want to because Franklin County is never going to come back and check. Right. Which leads to what exactly what you said. Yes, sir, it's a big issue. And I agree with that. And you made a motion on that? I will. Oh, no. put, I'll put that in the form of a motion. And I'll second it. I got a motion on approved by Commissioner Perry, second by Commissioner Jones. And people, all we doing is telling you to follow the letter of the law. If you don't follow it, we're going to have you to pull it up. Simple as that. Mr. Chairman. Something else, too. This might be another potential assignment for a code compliance department. Just something that reinforces what we just discussed today. Okay. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Pass unanimous. Okay. The next item on the um, agenda is a final plat application. It's consideration of a request um, for final replat of Island Breeze to Island Breeze Phase 2, a four-lot subdivision line in Section 28, Township 8 South, Range 6 West, East Point, Franklin County, Florida. Request submitted by Thurman Roddenberry, agent for Charles and Angela Overstreet, applicants. Staff recommendation, the promised changes have been made to the parcel south of Highway 98. Staff recommends approving this item. Okay. I got a motion on floor by Commissioner Massey. Second with discussion. Second by Commissioner Jones. Discussion. A Amy, they were basically just having to redo the property south of 98, correct? They were, um, basically, they had a, um, I'll show you on this final plat here. The okay. original plat had a, um, a road that was um, platted in the center of the south two properties um, that's on Highway 98. Mm -hmm. So all the lots entered through Highway 98 through that one road. They took the road out. The two back lots will access off of CC land okay. and the two front lots will access off of Highway 98. So that's what the that's difference. basically the only difference. Okay. And then the language on the south parcels, the four mm -hmm. um, parcels that's on the south side of the road, they're not buildable, right. but the um, app the lots have access to those parcels. Okay. So that's been cleared up. Okay. I just wanted to confirm that's that's what I remembered. I'm just making sure. This is not pulling up. Oh, well, it's slow today, isn't it? Yeah. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Approved <coughs> unanimous. Okay. Come on. <laughs> you can close it. Close it. Okay. Would you like to see it or? No. You can. Okay. So they can see it on their own. On their okay. The next item we have is a commercial site plan review. Consideration of a request for commercial site plan review for an 8,000 square foot 
climate-controlled self-storage facility located at 162 U.S. Highway 98 East Point, Franklin County, Florida. 32 units will be conditioned and eight will be non-conditioned units. Request submitted by Wade Brown, Edwin Brown & Associates, Jonathan Barwick, Southeastern Engineering Agents for 98 Storage LLC applicant. Staff recommendation, um, this project is located in front of the existing Seminole self-storage buildings in East Point. This application um, appears to meet all the requirements for commercial development. Staff recommends approving this item. Would you like to see a site plan? So moved. Second, with, with comment. Got a mo motion on floor by Commissioner Jones, second by Commissioner Burke. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? The passion on them. I just wanted to comment that I, I did look at the site plans and drove by. Just uh, well done. And what they're going to do is add more, but you don't see it from the highway. It's all in the back of the property that they have there. Yes, sir. Neat, neat look. <laughs> Um, item W has been taken off. It's been withdrawn by the applicant. Um, he has decided to place it, um, come back to another property and do commercial site plan review on a different property. So he's taken that one off. Okay. okay. The next one um, is a consideration of a request to construct a commercial pool, pole barn activity center, men and women's bathhouse, four coastal suites, laundry and check-in center located at 909, U.S. Highway 98, East Point, Franklin County, Florida. Request submitted by Michael Simon, um, Cox Pools, Agent for Coastline Rentals, LLC, applicant. So um, Got a motion on the floor by Commissioner. <coughs> Commissioner Masters. Second. Second by Commissioner Jones. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? That passed unanimous. Okay. On the next ones, we have um, land use and rezoning applications. Um, this one is a consideration of a request for a public hearing 1.4. We can't tell you. That, that's what I'm kind of confused about. It, it, I've only been here for three and a half years, but every time we've had a request such as this, the board's always approved going to a public hearing. Right. So I don't, I mean, I understand what they're saying, and I understand where the property is located, but. It's a request for the public hearing. This can be hashed out in the public hearing? Well, I'm sure it can. Um, yeah. It's just a part of the analysis that's going to be required. Let me ask you a question. Yes, sir. If they asking for a public hearing, what what they ask for before? Is this all they ask for? They didn't ask for nothing else? No, they're just asking for a public hearing to um, change the property zoning and land use. Well, we got to give them a public hearing. I mean, we can't deny them a public hearing. Dr. Shuler? <laughs> oh. If I heard the staff's recommendation, they did not recommend denying. They set the table for more information, but, but you are correct. The board's policy has been to send people to a public hearing and not deny them the opportunity for the public hearing. What I don't really know is uh, I'm not sure what the reason for the tabling is or what other information is being asked for, so I'm not really in a position to advise the board one way or the other on, on staff's request. But I did not understand the request to be to deny a public hearing. Just they're, they're apparently staff is looking for more information uh, from the applicant so the staff can then can make a recommendation to the board. But uh, it, it is certainly at the discretion of the board if you want to go ahead and proceed to a public hearing as I believe it was the chairman said we could hash it out there. One, one question, Mr. Chairman. If we send it to a public hearing and, and request is denied, then he can't come back for a year, right? That's correct. That's correct. That's oh. so if he don't so when he gets here, if he don't bring us more information, because over the years Duke Energy doesn't allow you to develop anything under their transmission lines. If those transmission lines are damaged, you gotta go in there with trucks and other things and you can't have development underneath those transmission lines and them still have access to get in there and fix it. Now, if you send it to a public hearing uh, and you deny it, and he can't come back for a year. If you table it and they let him get more information and then he has a public hearing, you know, it may be approved by the board or, or it could be approved the way it is, but I've never known Duke Energy. That transmission line runs 
kind of like down through the middle of East Point. Mm -hmm. And the last time this subject come up, they said, well, you can plant flowers or something, but if we have to go in there, we're going to run over your flowers. But they're not going to allow you to develop under that because they could have you develop a house under there and the power line breaks and set your house on fire. They're liable. So they're not going to allow development under there. Mm -hmm. And the question that I think, as I understand what staff's recommending, you can't rezone Duke Energy's uh, easement for this transmission line going down through the middle of East Point. You don't own it. So you can't rezone it. You can't do anything with it because you don't own it. But the request and what he's asking to be rezoned is part of the easement that Duke Energy has for these transmission lines. Uh, and, and this will affect the next request as well. Well, what if... We won't be denying them a public hearing. We'll put out the public hearing to... They're asking for more information because he's got to take that out. Come. If he don't take that out, then it's probably going to be denied here at the Board of County Commission. Then he can't do nothing for a year after that. But we just put it off till they get... Um, we're just asking for it to be tabled until they can provide us documentation from Duke that what they're anticipating putting there um, in the future is actually going to be able to be done instead of, you know, we go through the whole process and then Duke says, you can't do this. And they went through the whole process and been denied any activity or any allowances from Duke. So, can I ask you a question? Is it best to table it and Lori give him a chance to see what he can do, ain't it? Yes, the tabling is not denying him due diligence. It's just tabling him for a duration to find out if Duke will allow anything to be done in those easements, um, or else he's spending a lot of time and money um, trying to rezone something that he may not be able to do in the future. Mr. Okay. Chairman, yeah. uh, how do you rezone something you don't own? I think he owns the property. He just doesn't own, um, he just, the easement through it, he's not allowed to do anything with. Well, I, that's what I'm saying. So it's basically. But you're saying that part of what he's wanting to rezone is part of the right of way for this transmission line. Yes, sir. Well, how do you rezone something you don't own? He can rezone the property he owns, but not that easement because he don't own and, it. And I don't know the legal aspects of that. Um, I don't either. I'm not a, a lawyer, <laughs> but if you don't own something, you can't, you can't rezone it. I, I, I got that much sense you, to know that you can't do that unless, unless they convey that easement Yes, Mr. Sir. Millender, then you can rezone it, but they're not going to do that because they no, can't sir. get in there maintain the transmission line. So they're not going to. I mean, that would be setting a big precedent for Duke Energy because all the way down through there, they'd have to rezone it for every, I mean, give everybody that right away. And they're not going to give up the right away because they can't maintain the line. It do uh, But Damon, how long do you think it's going to take y'all to get, gather that information? Um, that would depend on the applicant. He would have to reach out to Duke and. Oh, he going he gonna do it. Yes, sir. The the analysis is done by the the applicant. Okay. Is he want to retable? I'm not sure. I think I'm, I'm sure he wants it to favor. go forward, but um, Mark has went through the the whole report and the analysis, and that's what he he stated that um, you know staff recommends tabling this res request until the applicant supplies further analysis as requested. I think, what, if I may, Mr. Chairman, I think what, I'm sorry, sir, if you wanted to go ahead. What Commissioner Parrish and Commissioner Massey are saying is basically the same thing. So it looks like, it sounds like we need to table it for his protection. Not necessarily the county's doing anything wrong. We're not trying to deny it, but for his protection to save him from being denied and having to wait a year to resubmit is the best thing, the best course forward for everybody right now is to table it, let him get that information, satisfy your staff, and then they can come back with a favorable response. Mm -hmm. Then we proceed with the public hearing. If, I, if I'm kind of voicing. I just don't see how you can rezone something you don't own. Yeah. Okay. He's going to have to take that out. All I'll right. See. I'll tell you what we can do. We can table it. And if he ain't satisfied with the table, We'll get in the public here. Mr. Chairman, I got a, well, a question. And, and I, as far as the applicant, everything they're going through presently, by tabling an item now before it goes to the public hearing, that's actually the most economically 
uh, sustainable for them, correct? They're not out any money without Yes, that's public. correct. When, once okay. a public hearing is approved, yes. then we charge them for a um, land use and rezoning. That's a $500 request per item. Okay. Okay. And he has two items under the same um, circumstance on the agenda today. Okay. So that's a $1,000, you okay. know, of requests that he yeah. could possibly be denied. Yeah. So um, with that in mind, I move to table this. I Second. I got a motion on the floor by Commissioner Jones, second by Commissioner Massa. Discussion. <clears throat> hey, how about telling them to get all the good information he can on this? Because he's going to need it. I mean, because if he come up there without no information, I don't think that's going to look good for him. Not great. Thank you. All right. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. All opposed? That passed your none. Okay. The next one is a consideration of a request for a public hearing to change um, 0.34 of an acre parcel for a land use change from commercial and residential to commercial and um, a rezoning from C4 residential mixed use and R4 single family home industry to C3 commercial recreation on property described as 15 4th Street, East Point Franklin County, Florida. Request submitted by East Point Lands, um, Bruce Millinder applicant. Um, again, staff um, recommendation, this property is located on an easement for the electrical transmission line through East Point and I am uncertain what development Duke Energy will allow beneath the transmission line. It is um, located on 4th Street which connects to Otter Slide Road and carries more traffic than the average residential um, street in East Point. The applicant has not submitted any analysis to support this request. Staff recommends tabling this request until the applicant supplies more information about the requested change. So, um, got a motion on the floor by... To table. Oh, to table. Yeah, <laughs> that, that was what she to said the request was. Okay. Got a Second. motion on the floor by Commissioner Jones to table. Second. Second by Commissioner Matthew and Perry. Okay. And, and that both of them the same, right? Hmm. Yes, sir. Okay, tell them the same thing to bring in the document, document. Document, document. He's no. gonna, he gonna need them. Mr. Chairman, I got one. It says point three four acres. What is he asking for to put on a third of an acre? It's uh, my understanding that he is wanting to do um, RV um, RV parking pads for workforce housing. And how many of them does he want to put on a third of an acre? That'll depend on um, if he has water and sewer availability and how many um, the health department. The health department regulates how many units you can put on a on a lot. And so um, we don't if know it's all of this before it comes to us, we don't have no information about no. what's going on or anything. No, that, that's my understanding of that's what he's intending under C3. Well, I mean, I understand that, but yeah. we don't have a site plan or anything? Not for the... Are you going to try no. to put 100 campers on a third of an acre? I mean, what are, what are we... Without information, how are we supposed to make a, an informed decision? On these, exactly he did... What, yeah. So he rezones it, then he has to come back with a site plan? Is Commercial that, site plan approval. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. What kind of... I, mean, I, I just don't know what all you can do on a third of an acre. Not a whole lot. I, I didn't hear what kind of pads are you saying? RVs. Par, R, RV pads. Um, it's basically, it's the health department requires a certain dimension um, concrete pad or paver pad per RV that's allowed on the park. Um, so they have to space it out to meet those, um, those standards through the health department. He wants to be an RV park. Um, yes. That's, that's my understanding. Yes, sir. Is both of these, they next to each other? Sir? Is both of these, huh? Is they, they lot next to each other? No, sir. No, sir. One is um, near Go um, Centennial Bank area, and the other one is um, near the fire department area. I'm like Smokey. I don't think they're going to let you put a camper front or power line. I don't. Do we have to get permission to pull a camp across there from foot? If you're putting a 
trailer of camp or bike there, you, and you cross the lake transmission line on the lake transmission, you got to get permission from them to go up on Duke would have to approve anything that they do, um, and that's the, the information that we don't have, um, and that's why we're asking for it to be tabled, because we don't have the information that Duke will allow that in the analysis, and they did not provide that information. So we're not sure that Duke will allow. I'm pretty sure they probably won't. Mm -hmm. But um, just like to lift up the line for the thing to go up on. Yeah, the lines are you know pretty tall up there, but um, still they follow they're the camper yeah parked the, up under there and catch yeah. the fire and Duke's liability just went yeah. through the roof. That's in big lines too. Yeah, big yes. not, well, the, not small. Those are big. transmission lines, and yeah. the, the, the issue is we're right back to what, what you mentioned before. <laughs> When they get their transmission line, they get easements. The easements is their property. I know. So, so the problem is like, how can you? Y y yeah, I mean, we have a problem with rezoning something that might we not even have the authority to discuss rezoning. Basically, well, you don't. If, even if they allowed it, you wouldn't rezone it for Mr. Miller. You'd rezone it for Duke Energy because they're the ones that own the property. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Because you rezone easement. something you don't own. Their easement. That's my my issue and chief the staff is saying that he's provide no analysis to show that he does own it but he's requesting to rezone it you understand what i'm saying it'd be like me requesting to rezone commissioner jones's property well i don't own it so i can't come here and request to rezone it when i don't even own it so well let me let me get the street of this what the man rezoning his property or the well, he has what? the deed to the property, but there is an easement through the deed. Um, so he's well, asking, he I guess, easement. for the whole property, but he doesn't have the sufficient analysis. Okay. Yeah, Duke has an easement on his property, Commissioner. Yeah. That's what you're asking. Yes, sir. Yeah. So that, that property has already been dedicated to, basically dedicated to Duke yeah. Energy. That's right. For this power line to come through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nothing happened. Yeah. We'll see. Oh, no. All participants. Uh, that was me. Y'all ready to vote? That's me, come here. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Uh, All opposed? That passed unanimously. That concludes my agenda. Thank you, Miss Amy. Y'all keep up the good work. Thank you. You get to be a headache sometime, though. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to go to. If we may, uh, Mr. Chairman, I see on the phone is Ms. Boudreau is, is holding from, um, I'm going to unmute her from Langton Consultants. She is, she is uh, page four. Uh, Ms. Melissa Boudreau just wants to give you an update on some Restore Act Part 1 projects. And after that, we'll do the RFP, the opening. Um, we'll go back up to Jay. So, Ms. Boudreau, you've been unmuted. Good morning. Are you here? Can you hear me? Yes, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we sure can. Good morning. Hi. Um, so thank you all. Good morning, uh, commissioners. This is Melissa Beaudry with Langton Consulting. Um, we are your consultants working on the Restore Act Pot 1 project. And um, this process has been, as you all know, extremely frustrating. And so I wanted to give you an update of where we're at. Um, the MYP was approved in the beginning of 2020 and uh, unfortunately with timing, grant cycles open and close and the Treasury Pot 1 cycle closed uh, for their last round of applications and uh, it, it subsequently right after the MYP was approved. Um, but thankfully, hopefully Treasury has told us that they, in closing it, they did that so that they could improve the process and try and make it more efficient um, instead of having it in these different forms online in grant solutions. So they have just reopened their new application system. It still is an online system, but they, um, they say that it'll make it more efficient on their end. It looks pretty similar on our end, but um, we are hopeful that that means that we can submit the applications and won't, it won't take a year to get a, a grant award the way it has in the past. Um, so if you see on the, the two projects that were approved in the MYP is $110,000 for the countywide dune restoration and $110,000 for the St. George Island stormwater drainage improvement project. 
So these will be two planning grants to do all of the design work for those two projects. Um, and so we are in the final stages of putting those applications in the system and under this new application portal and uh, and then we will go through the process of getting approval. Um, I anticipate getting approval on those. It, it will still take probably two to three months to get approval just because it is still Treasury. Um, but uh, so we'll hopefully get approval in October um, and potentially November of this year. So we can back in once we get further into the process of getting approval from Treasury and starting, you know, all the 10, 20 people in the department that have to put eyes on this and approve it. We can go ahead and back into the bid process once we um, have an anticipated award date. And, uh, and that way we aren't losing any time um, more than we already have in order to get these bids on the street. I'm also going to be, I put together the applications in a way that we should be able to streamline from design straight into construction. Um, instead of having to do a different application for construction, I'm hoping that, um, that we can, we can move that a, a little bit quicker. So I'm, I'm waiting on, uh, approval from treasury that I can streamline that, but, um, should be able to under the new system. So those. Uh, those two projects are uh, in play and um, you know we we don't get paid until the work gets done so I just wanted to make it you know clear that we're not sitting here you know racking up hours and it not moving forward we feel your frustration and want this project to move forward um, as well and so uh, we are continuing to work with Treasury we've been on email with them this morning actually just about this project and trying to get clarity on um, the uh, authorizing user process. So uh, I'm available. I just want to also say I, I know this process is frustrating and like bring up questions. So um, I'm obviously happy to take questions right now, but I'm also available to do more um, reports with you all or uh, can answer resident questions or any other um, aspects related to, to restore. Uh, happy to be available at any time to you all. So. Um, at this time, I'll, I'll stop talking and take questions from you all on um, on the process and where we're at. Chairman, I had a question. Go ahead. Uh, Ms. Melissa, this is Ricky Jones, uh, Commissioner Jones, District 1, uh, the Island East Point. I, I have a question that I just want to make sure so we can inform the public. When did we start this process for these two projects? Uh, that would be, so the, the process to start the, the, the work of the multi-year implementation plan yep. was back in 20, well, you all are probably talking about it in 2018, and um, I'd have to look back, and I don't have that exact date of when we right. started the MYP process, but it was in 2019. Okay. So then we had to develop the MYP, we then had to go out to public comment, it then had to go under review to Treasury, and then get approval. And so we got approval for the MYP in January 23rd of 2020. Um, and that, then we have the, the process of the um, application portal having to reopen. So again, even though this is your money and, and it should be flowing continuously, um, it is still technically a grant application that goes through the federal system. And so it has to have application open and closed dates, just like you know other competitive grants that the county would apply for. Um, and this lag was a little bit more because they changed their their online system. So it closed until it just reopened on uh, in uh, July 1st of 2020. And then we got um, approval on July 20th for the RFQs. So now we are ready to submit in the online system. So that's, and, that, and those dates um, I believe should be listed in uh, in the agenda here. Those, those dates of the, um, January 23rd for the MYP and July 20th for the approval of the RFQs. Right. Thank you, Melissa. That's exactly the answer I was looking for. The fact that we've been in this process as a board now for at least a year and a half or two years. So thank you, for answering the question. That's exactly mm -hmm. the answer I was looking for. Yes, sir. Melissa, uh, this is uh, Burke Bolt and County Commissioner for District 2. And of course, I'm interested in this uh, countywide dune restoration in our area. Um, a couple of questions. What does MYP stand for? Those initials? Um, 
Mm -hmm. The MYP stands for the multi, multi-year implementation plan. Some people put the I in it. Treasury doesn't. It doesn't matter. But it's the planning document that Treasury requires for a county to to plan how they want to spend their allocation over the you know 15 years or whatever we say that the money will um, become available to the local government. Um, and so this is a, a document that we will update. Um, and we will have to do that once we, you know, get these projects rolling. Then I'll be coming to you all to say, all right, let's plan ahead. And what, you know, there's going to be more money available. How do you all as a county, what do the, what are the projects that we want to be using Restore Act funding for? And we will be using that same model of developing. And it's, it's a fairly simple, it's really just a projection of, you know, when the funds are anticipated to be used and what's the scope of work and how does it meet the eligibility. But it is the planning document required before submitting applications for specific projects. Okay, I see. And this 110000 that you're budgeting is for design work only of these planning projects. Is that correct? Yes. Correct. Okay. Because then once we do the design, we'll have an understanding of the construction cost, and then that would be funded through Restore. So those, you are correct, those two um, uh, construction projects would be the first use of, of funds uh, after approval of the planning grant. Okay, and just please keep us informed and, and show us uh, illustrations as we go forward so we can show our constituents. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir, and I can provide, um, I can, we're, we, we might be looking at, we're, we're talking about Restore at the next board meeting as well, just because um, I want to let you all know when I get the application submitted. So uh, I, I'd like, if there's room on the agenda in the near future to, to give another update to you all. And I can also provide that outline of the multi-year implementation plan and how we would be, um, you know, what, how many funds are available, what's the total number of funds available um, for construction of these activities, and, and how we can start to think through um, the, the future thinking for other projects if there's additional funds. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is Commissioner Parrish. Uh, Commissioner Burke. The multi-year implementation plan. A lot of, a lot of counties that got BP funds had their money planned out when they wanted to use it, what they wanted to use it for. If you remember, we come up with the dune restoration program after Hurricane Michael washed most of the dunes away on St. George Island, along with some down in your, in your area, Alligator Point, and trying to put up sand fence and other mechanisms to build these dunes back up. Our county has not stepped out and said, well, this is a 10-year plan and this is what we want to do in 10 years because things change so much. Things change so much. So we're, kind of, we're a lot slower than other counties in doing this multi-year implementation program. We're kind of doing it project by project. So as things change, you don't want to obligate all that money at one time because things change. Mm -hmm. And, and we're trying to take care of issues as they come along rather than doing a 10-year plan with all the money allocated and all the money spent because if something comes up that needs to be implemented and this is a funding source for that, you also know that we pretty much obligated $4 million to try to do beet tree nourishment in order to protect that road at Alligator Point. But there's issues there coming up with, with a, a way of putting the, putting the, the uh, re-nourished beach back should it wash away because FEMA won't pay but for 50% of it. But we, as a county, did say we would put $4 million towards building that beach, but we're not going to do that until the people of Alligator Point agree to some kind of funding mechanism that would set aside 50% of the cost to try to help redo it should it wash away. And you know how the road washes away, what, three times already this year? So, so these are some of the things, and that multi-year implementation plan means that you can allocate these dollars over a period of 10 or 15 years, but you don't want to get a plan approved like that when things change at a moment's notice, tropical storms, hurricanes, and, and other things. So, and, and until we decide what we're going to do with the road down there, are we going to do beach re-nourishment or are we not? So, so as, as Melissa talks about the multi-year implementation plan, that's correct. And a lot of counties done a 10-year plan and they spent all their money. It's already been allocated for a plan that spans 10 years where we're going a lot slower. And, and another thing, when it comes down to this BP money, is, is the board, uh, and some of the members are no longer with us, some of them are still here, decided that we would not allocate all of this money. 
because things could change 10 years from now. This money is set aside in treasury and it don't go nowhere. It's in the name of Franklin County. So it may be 15 years from now. It may, we may need more help with the oyster industry. There are a lot of different scenarios that may come up that we may need some help and this is our funding mechanism. So, and you know, just because you have money in the bank don't mean you spend all the money in the bank. And that's kind of the way the board has mm -hmm. looked at it over these years is, is you know, go, we're a little slower, Melissa will tell you, we are a little slower than a lot of other counties. We've not allocated a lot of dollars, but you, the allocation comes down so much a year to begin with. So we're letting the allocation build up. We didn't receive one big check in one year. It's over 15 years, if I'm not mistaken, that we get our money. And we get a little each year, which mm -hmm. builds up in the bank. But we're going to use that money, or the board decided earlier, we're going to use that money as things arose. And we may not even be on this board, and there may be an emergency with Franklin County that we need a, a funding source. And this is it, and it's a one-time source. You spend it, it's gone, and there is, mm -hmm. there is no other allocation for Franklin County. So that's kind of the way the board has worked in the past. And uh, I just want to explain yeah. to you a little more about the NYIP. Sure. And now you know what it stands for, but sure. this is the way it's being used. You know, some people spend it all, you know, come up with a big scheme and, and spend it all yeah. over a period of years where we've been a little bit slower. And as we look at Hurricane Michael, we're able to do some things that I think the community needs because without restoration of those dunes and some of these houses on the island get washed away and they're no longer paying taxes, you know what position that puts the county government in. So I think this is a good use of the funds. These are the planning grants. Now what we have to spend to actually implement those plans, we don't know because it's still in design. That's what this money is for, we'll design, and then see what we need to complete the project. <coughs> Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you very much. I have one more question, Mr. Chairman. Please. Ms. Melissa, I have another question. So I know that we're just getting started and just getting to a point of actually getting this money for design. What's the reasonable expectation that the board and the public should have between design and when the projects might actually go out to bid these first two projects? Uh, that is a great question that I, uh, it would be contingent on how long the consultants take to plan. So we aren't bound by treasury to, you know, have a certain amount of time between planning and de design and, and construction. So once we, you know, go out to bid this fall for the planning work, uh, and, uh, a consultant is selected, however long that process takes, I can go ahead and start be starting on, um, you know, once we can kind of get some better numbers for the, the construction costs, even if you don't have final design done, if we can just get, you know, the budget done and a, a scope, then I can start to be putting together that NYP process and the, the, uh, the grant applications and be doing that concurrently with the planning work so that then once we're ready to submit that application for the construction, um, hopefully we aren't, uh, you know, losing too much time, as I was saying. But I would, I would say it's, it's up to however long the design work takes, um, plus adding in, you know, a, a couple months for that, that treasury review and, and the process. But I, so well, I would hope that we would be under construction by, I would say, you know, summer to fall of next year is a, is, is a potential estimate, but that's based on, you know, a couple different factors I don't have control over. I understand. Thank you. Yes, sir. And, and anything else for, we appreciate, I, go ahead. If, if I could just uh, say one, one additional thing, I just wanted to tag on to what Commissioner Parrish said. He is spot on that, um, that you, you all have taken a more conservative approach to your funding. And, uh, you know, we're working with several different counties and we're, we're very aware of what a lot of the different counties are doing with their money. And while, yes, it looks like you are going slower, I think you are doing the right thing by not uh, trying to plan out and create expectations to the public on projects that, that aren't necessarily either the priority, you know, uh, years down the road or the other issue that a lot of counties are running into now is they've planned out their money, those priorities do change, and now they have to go back and redo the whole planning document and the whole process um, and you can have to go and redo and start over from scratch with the process 
for even a simple scope change, which is what happened in Gulf County with their beach nourishment project. We had a change in the budget, scope, same project, doing beach nourishment, but, you know, they didn't have all the details and they had to go restart the whole process. So I just wanted to echo what uh, Commissioner Parrish said. He is spot on that. You are taking a more conservative approach, and while it might seem like it's slower, it is uh, a more efficient and effective way, we feel, to, to utilize your funds. So. And when we do look at the NYP, there is nothing that says you all have to go and dedicate and find additional projects. That money can sit there to the benefit of Franklin County for, you know, however long you all take to decide what those projects um, that are meaningful for the county should use those funds for. Be all right. Okay. We appreciate you doing it. We'll be all right. Long down, go broke. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Melissa. Talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, Commissioner. So next, what I would like to do is basically open the, um, the bids uh, for the St. George Island uh, restroom design. I'm sorry, for the construction of the St. George Island restroom design. And then maybe we can squeeze in uh, uh, the, uh, Mr. Walker. And then I don't know if we still have a little bit of time if, if the clerk wants to go then or she'll wait till this afternoon, go break for lunch and then come back. So let's do the opening of the bids now and then we'll go to Weems. If you're good with that. I have three bids in front of me and that's one at a time. Uh, the first one is from Storm Construction LLC. They have an address of 309 Marine Street in Carabell, Florida. If I'm not mistaken, Aaron's the same company that won the bid for the uh, uh, road department. Okay. So you should also have a bid tabulation sheet in front of you <coughs> to record this. Yeah, let's see here. Their total base bid is $450,000. Total base bid is $450,000, even. Uh, they got a, a bond. bond. Yes, they sure do. Bid bond is attached to the back. Okay. This. Let's see here. It's Oliver Sperry renovation and still Oliver who? Oliver Sperry okay. renovation. I'm looking to see if they have an address. They didn't put one up front. They have a bid bond commissioner. That's in the okay. back. And on their letterhead, they have a Tallahassee, Florida address. And if I could just work my fingers correctly, I can tell you guys. Base bid is, their base bid is $568,893, even $568,893. Oliver Sperry out of Tallahassee, Florida. And the final bid will be coming from North Florida Construction Incorporated. They have a Clarksville, Florida address. Open it with me and still using my finger. Let's see here. Their base bid is four hundred and sixty eight thousand and a dollar. Four six eight zero zero one. And Commissioner, I am looking for the bid bond, and there it is to the back. That's all three. Okay. 
We all so, got a committee? No, it's not a committee. We'll go to the engineer for review. So I need a motion uh, to send okay. out this to the engineer for review. So I move. Second. I got a motion on approved by <coughs> Commissioner Masters, second by Commissioner Jones. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? That passed unanimously. I would what 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 uh, Ms. Griffith is, Mrs. Griffith is asking should she start doing some research and financing for the uh, construction portion of, of the bid, which will be financed and then it'll be paid back through mm -hmm. uh, through TDC. TDC. So moved. Second. I got a motion on approved by Commissioner Perry, <coughs> second by Commissioner Jones. Find a bank or whatever. Mm -hmm. we bring that back to the board. Bring that back to the board and TDC gonna pay the money. Yes. On monthly. Yes. Or yearly. Or yearly. Yearly. Okay. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? That passed unanimous. All right. Good. Now we got that project done. Okay. So, sir? Next on the agenda will be Mr. <coughs> Dr. Walker. Good morning. David Walker, um, interim CEO, George E. Williams Memorial Hospital. Um, first of all, thank you all for, for all you do, you know, as commissioners, um, there's a whole lot of different moving parts with it. So, you know, we definitely thank you all. The first thing, um, we only have one action item for you today, but I have some information on items. Um, our heads off to Pam Brunel, I think I mentioned this before, um, in partnership with the state EOC. Um, they delivered us 30,000 surgical masks and 1,000 1, face shields last month to the hospital. And so what that did, that increased our PPE um, availability at the hospital. Secondly, um, some ongoing partnerships with Tell Asper Memorial Healthcare. Um, a, new wound, a new wound clinic is coming to the hospital. We have had ongoing discussions and meetings with TMH representatives to add various service lines to the hospital and clinics. Wound care service will be our first service line. TMH wound care representatives visit the hospital for a meeting to discuss this service line earlier last month. They met with Dr. Jikes, one of our emergency room physicians, Suzette Veldueza in the APRN at our clinic, and Susan Barskert and myself. And so what, what this would happen, would do for the people in, in Franklin County, you know, we have a lot of people in our county that are going out of county for wound care services. And so this is something that we're going to bring into the hospital, um, on the grounds of the hospital, and either running out of the hospital or running out of the clinic here. Um, and one of the reasons why you run it out of the hospital is because you get better um, reimbursement if it's hospital-based if it's you know, on the grounds of the hospital. So that's very something that we're looking favorable at. We already have um, staff that um, work at TMH that some of them have houses or uh, family owned houses on the island um, in Franklin County and they're willing to help us staff this clinic. So that's gonna be very, very um, good for our residents here. And what we'll do, we'll start small and then we'll build it up you know, as the, as the demand um, go. But we looked at the numbers and they, they, they truly feel that the numbers that we have of people leaving this county for wound care <laughs> services, we really can have a wound care program here um, in, in our county. And that'll create access to care as well. And that's what we really want to do with anything that we do at the hospital. We want to begin to think outside the box and try to create access to care here. Um, on a bit of great news also, working with TMH, uh, we hosted a physician in Franklin County last month who, who was interested in Franklin County, who's working, who's interested in working in Franklin County. The physician met with hospital staff, toured both the hospital and clinics. He has a background in critical access hospitals and rural health clinics, as well as EMS. Um, TMH has offered the physician a contract, and the physician has accepted. His tentatively start date is for November 23rd, 2020, and TMH, of course, will pay us market share price for the lease of our facilities. So this young physician um, has family in Ocala. They, he wants to move back into the area. He lives out of town. Um, He's five years ago. He talked with um, previous administrator here about coming in, but he was just a little unsettled um, because of some things around the hospital. Um, big hats off, really, to Jenny Griner. Um, the physician has been in contact with her throughout the years, and then when we had an opportunity to try to grab him, you know, he came down to visit the area, and um, he wanted to be close to his family. He really liked Weems. Currently, he works at a critical SS hospital up north. Um, he also oversees the is the EMS department, he oversees them. He also runs the clinic, so he, he does a whole dip, lot of different things. He's a young guy with a young family, so we're very, very excited about that particular part, partnership. 
Um, our ongoing statewide coordination efforts, um, we're still on calls with the Surgeon General in ACA. You know, they're looking at, the, of course, you know, availability of beds statewide, ICU, ICU beds. One of the other things, you know, we're continuing to monitor, and they're monitoring on a statewide level, is staffing for surging hotspots, meaning that when um, um, facilities or hospitals in areas, you know, have a surge of, of hotspots, the, the state has um, employed these professionals, nursing professionals, to come into the communities to assist hospitals, you know, to reduce burnout in that area. We still have monthly calls with TMH and Capital Regional, you know, just to make sure we continue to partner with this particular epidemic. You know, we believe that COVID-19 will be around. You know, it's not going anywhere. Right now, we may be on a downward turn of it, but we still have flu season coming up. And so when flu season come up and with COVID-19, it's almost like a Super Bowl. You know, you're preparing at that moment there. And if we really can get through that pretty good, um, I think we'll, we'll be okay, but it's gonna take a lot of partnership. And then when schools start back, um, we've just got to work together and, you know, cause there's gonna be a lot of um, variables there, you know? So we, we're, we're in uncharted territory right now. I, I, I like to say we haven't been this way before, but God has. And, and so we just got to continue to work together with our local partners here. And I think in Franklin County, you know, what you've seen, you know, from the healthcare entities in Franklin County is really a joining together, you know, as well as working with other um, organizations or other um, county departments or city departments. We're really working together, really, with COVID-19. I think COVID-19 kind of like pushed us together, as well as a more of a regional um, strategy to tackle this with our major hospitals, you know, in Tallahassee, as well as in Bay County. You know, they are really reaching out to us and we're reaching out to them as well. Um, anybody got any questions before I go to the action items? Oh. I just wanted some comments, Mr. Chairman, if I can. Oh, yeah. uh, David, I think that wound care clinic is spectacular. Mm -hmm. I've seen it successfully operated at TMH, and uh, on behalf of Capital Health Plan, they actually have a wound care clinic component within their facility. And with 1,248 or so insured lives here in Franklin County, I see a lot of compatibility there. Um, just a clinical comment, uh, I, I do specialize in, in uh, post-wound care management, and I just wanted to uh, uh, invite you to consider having a, uh, a compression garment component uh, post-wound care after the wound is healed, and sometimes during when the wound is healed. Compression helps facilitate wound healing even more and keeps the wound from reoccurring in the future. Now, I know your staff will know about that, so just wanted to mention that part. I also see um, uh, this partnership with TMH is probably worth $300,000, in my opinion, mm -hmm. that TMH is essentially saying, here, Franklin County, here's $300,000, and bringing in that physician and all the components that go into that. And um, I, I think, again, this just shows a tremendous opportunity that we have here with TMH and our management company working with TMH. And then also, just a general question, um, what's the story on flu vaccinations, mm -hmm. standard flu vaccinations, not the COVID type, but the yeah. other ones, as we enter in yeah. this new season? What's yeah. your thoughts? Yeah, what, yeah what'll happen is that, um, you know, you probably see a flu, a flu vaccination campaign come out, you know, okay. from the health department. Of course, we'll join in uh, with them as well. Um, and so, that probably will start in October, maybe September. You'll start seeing a lot of notices out. And we they probably do a campaign to really encourage people to get that vaccination, you know, before flu season really kick in. Mm -hmm. But that's, it was a talk the Surgeon General mentioned that this morning. And then we've been in some talks with our staff, our clinical staff about that also. Because um, we can run a flu campaign ourselves, but we pr prefer to do it in partnership with the health department because that's something that they specialize in. And then we'll just probably tag on it like we do the COVID testing, like the pods that we've been doing throughout the community. I'm sure we'll be doing these uh, flu-like testing sites, you know, throughout the county. Um, and so that's going to be very important, you know, when flu season, um, and then you got COVID, you know, so it's, it's very important that we play our roles with it. But I, th I think also that a lot of us have been washing our hands a lot more. <laughs> that may help out for flu, <laughs> flu season, <That's> right. <laughs> you, so. you know, so, but it's just, you know, it's uncharted territory right now. And I think, you know, when you add the children in the mix of it for flu, mm -hmm. you know, with COVID and the elderly, all that. Compacts, but I think you're gonna have a you have a, a great partnership with you know the agencies you know to do campaigns in the community, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's very important. Thank you. Great, thank you. 
Okay, going back uh, um, on the um, action item, we have um, Paycheck Protection Program. Last month, we were able to apply for the Paycheck Protection Program. This is this was time was of the of the essence, and we had to apply for the money before the funding was exhausted. People South Bank assisted us with the loan. We were approved for nine hundred thirty thousand eight fifty five. This was covered two and a half payrolls. The loan will be fully forgiven. Six percent of the money must be used for payroll costs, but we will use one hundred percent of the money for that. We were able to get the loan because we received less than fifty percent of our financial revenue from the county, and so we need board action um, to approve to accept the loan and authorization to open up account at People's South Bank. Um, initially, when the Paycheck Protection came about, and I, Aaron, you can jump in a minute, but when Paycheck Protection Program came about, the ho um, public hospitals uh, could not apply, you know, because we were owned by a public entity. And so it was, it was a lot of lobbying going forth, and then they came out with a plan, a rule saying that if we receive less than our, less than 50% of our revenue from the county, you know, we can apply. Um, so a lot of the small rural hospitals, critical SS hospitals, they applied early on when it first came out. And then you know the money ran out. And so we, we was called um, early last month, hey, you got a window of opportunity to apply you know, for this money. And we applied and we have it. And Aaron, go ahead. Yeah, and, and um, also the, the, one of the requirements is to set up a separate account where they can easily track payroll expenditures. Mm -hmm. So as far as for our office to be able to set up a new account for the county, we just need authorization to do that. Pleasure to move. So move. Got a motion on the floor by Commissioner Burt. Second. Second by Commissioner Master. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? That passed unanimous. There's another example of how the federal government favors rural hospitals. They're beginning to just stack up. Many, many levels of federal government saying, Franklin County, keep your hospital, keep it open, keep it going. Yeah. And we're looking for more investment, even with the Senate and the House bills, um, you know, really the uh, an infrastructure investment in rural hospitals, because I think that's been lacking throughout the decades. And so you may see a push, you know, for some of the lobbyists, you know, with the, like the American Hospital Association, uh, with all these hospitals saying, hey, don't forget about the, the rural hospitals. Let's see, can we pump more money into it, at least for infrastructure. So, um, you know, we're just at the table, you know, we want to be at the table with all of them, you know, to make sure that we can, don't forget about Franklin County. That's my, that's my main thing. You know, what can we do to advocate for our citizens here? But thank you all for your support. You know, I greatly appreciate it. And, you know, I haven't been a commissioner. I'm, I'm a pastor. I know sometimes we have so many things to deal with, but, you know, we just, we just want room into a very important um, house that you all manage. But thank you all. Appreciate it. Yeah, C9, cool. If we had went the other way, see, all this money would have been going to post bank too. So I think we've done the right thing to keep it here. Get it as long as we can get it. Well, thank you all. Appreciate it. Y'all have keep a great day. Good work, sir. All right, thank, thank you. you. You got something, great. Commissioner? No, I just, Mr. Chairman, if I can, I just want to clarify. So, where I understood we're at in the process was we were engaging with. Jim Coleman's company to see what we could come up mm. with. Mm. Okay, so I, I mean, I, I wouldn't. Look, there's been several statements made. I guess like it's all over and done with. Yeah, I mean, not, that's, no. that's what I'm trying to. Currently, where we are, we are, we are. No, uh, I'm not talking about just you, Commissioner Bolt. Also said something about it. Yeah, we we so are. So I'm just making sure I'm understand as a commissioner where yes. we're at. Where we're at right now, we're negotiating with uh, Mr. Coleman. Mm -hmm. um, and we will continue to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and from there, we, based on those negotiations, then we make a, a decision in which right, direction right. we're going. Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure I was understanding correctly. That's all it was. Well, my understanding was we we had two choices, and we we haven't picked right. Coleman yet. But out of the two, we went to Coleman. That that that's the way I think. Yes. That's correct. That's correct. No, that's correct. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Mm -hmm. I just that's was trying to clarify what I was understanding. Right. I don't want, you know. Well, if we had went, uh, that, that's why I said what I said. If we yeah. had went the other way, the money would have been going to St. Oh, it Kevin. definitely would not have been coming to us in this scenario. That's for right. sure. Because they wouldn't have, they want to put a overnight stay here. That's what they said. I don't know what you call it. Okay, Mr. Chairman, if, if we may. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. No, go, I'm, I'm finished. Go ahead. Okay, that was it for Mr. Walker? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else got anything, Mr. Walker? Keep up the good work, sir. All right, thank, thank you. you. Have a great day. What? Uh,
uh, Mr. Chairman, if, if I may, what I think we should do now is go to the clerk, let her do her report, and then with that, we can break for lunch, and depending what time we break is what time we'll come back. This afternoon, we'll basically have uh, Kim from um, Career, Source. Career Source. We'll have Deb, uh, Deborah Belcher, CDBG. We'll have Lori Swicer for the SHIP program. I'll finish up my report, and then that'll be it for this afternoon. If everybody's good with that. How you doing? Good evening. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Marsha Johnson, clerk. <laughs> Today, I need y'all to do some action relative to the Value Adjustment Board. We need to have two county commissioners appointed to the Value Adjustment Board for this year, and a citizen member who owns homestead property within the county must be appointed as well. Um, and the citizen member cannot be a member or employee of any taxing authority. Uh, Mr. Donnie Gay has served in that position for the last few years, and he has graciously agreed to serve again if the board wanted him to. So I need you to appoint two commissioners and appoint Mr. Donnie Gay as your citizen member for the Value Adjustment Board. I make a motion for Mr. Burke, Mr. Noah to do it, and Donnie Gay. Well, uh, Mr. Noah's in a contestant. Yeah, usually what you do, commissioners, is uh, it, it, when it's an election year, you use it to commissioners that are not um, running for election. That's, okay. That's how you usually do it, but uh, it's the will of the board. We'll have to use Smokey then. Is it okay that I'm on the uh, canvassing board to, yeah. to still? Yeah, completely different deal. Deal, deal, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I mean, Ricky's running and Noah's right, Mr. Noah's running. Mm -hmm. So I'm making a motion for Smokey and Mr. Burt and Donnie Gay. Sir. I got a motion on the floor by Commissioner Masters, second by Commissioner Jones. All in favor? Aye. Uh -huh. All the pool, that pass unanimous. And now I will say that Michael is, Michael Marone is working with Lori on this to try to do it um, using Zoom or some yeah, some other method to, to <laughs> so we don't have to meet in person, hopefully. Correct. All the, all, all the um, meetings would be virtual, so uh, for the most part, you, could, uh, you two could do it from in here, and then everybody else would be wherever they are. Okay. And I'll, I'll, I'll manage that, those okay. meetings. Yes. And I think last year, Lori, we only... We didn't even have any files, no. so you yeah. know who knows. We'll we'll hope for the best this year too. But no, we didn't have none last year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's my report. I, for information, your your county audit has been provided to each of you, I think, by Aaron, and mm -hmm. and it's out on your website for the county. The audit we had a good audit, so no no findings that we will, had to worry about. So that was good good news this year. So that's my report unless you have something for me. Keep up the good work. <laughs> <laughs> Be before you break, sir, Aaron wants to do a couple of updates on the budget, and then we could break for lunch. And if we're getting that close to 12, we probably want to come back at 1.30 because most of the restaurants get crowded pretty quickly here downtown. If they open? If they open, correct, sir. <laughs> <laughs> you are so right, sir. At your July 30th budget workshop, uh, the preliminary millage rate for the trim notices was set at 5.9026, which is just below the current millage rate of 5.9494. The renewal rates for capital health plan were not yet available at the time of the budget meeting, um, and we had used an estimated 10% increase, which was an additional $144,492 in additional expense. Um, Capital Health Plan released the renewed renewal rates yesterday to Franklin County at a 2% increase. The cost for individual coverage will rise from $645.31 per month to $658.22 per month. This reduction from the estimated 10% increase to 2% will reduce the proposed budget by $114,599. Although the rate that will go out on the trim notices will be the 5.9026, at the first public hearing, if all other conditions remain the same, the BOCC will be able to incorporate this reduction and the pre preliminary millage rate will fall to 5.8490. This, this is actually changing the preliminary budget from a 3.69% increase over the rollback rate to 2.75% over the rollback <laughs> rate. We are hopeful at this time that further reductions will be possible with legislative progress with the HEROES funding for revenue losses for county government and updates from the second revenue estimating conference later this month. Good. Now that okay. was a... That was good news. That was insurance. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I, we lucky. <laughs> That's the first time I... 
Two percent. Two percent. Yeah, two percent is great. <laughs> I get the guess they gave us a break behind the COVID. I had to. I thought they were going to throw the ball at us. That's <laughs> what I was <laughs> expecting to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, you got something else, Ms. Aaron? That, that's it. Okay, and, and what about the commissioners? Y'all y'all got anything for we break for lunch? Good. Hmm? Good. Good? Yes, sir. So, what, 1.30? 1.30. 1.30. 2.30? 1.30. It would be through by 2.30. Okay, <laughs> that concludes this morning meeting. The, is that the Boulder County Commission is now... I, out of session to 1.30. Okay. We'll be back in session at 1.30. Thanks.